Good morning, everyone. At this time, uh, we are ready to begin. Will all sergeants please start their recordings? Recording in progress. PC recording has started. Thank you. Hearing recording is uh, going is, is rolling. Thank you. Yeah, the cloud is underway. And Sergeant Martinez, make your opening statement, please. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to today's New York City Council hybrid hearing of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please silence your electronic devices. And if you wish to submit testimony, you may do so via email at the following address, land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We are ready to begin. Good morning. I'm Council Member Francisco Moya, Chair of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. Uh, I'm joined today by Council Members uh, Gradenchek, Borelli, Reynoso, uh, Ayala, and Rivera. Uh, we are also joined by Council Member uh, Levine. Today we will vote on 840 Atlantic Avenue proposal, <clears throat> which was heard by the subcommittee on August 3rd, and we will, uh, we will hold public hearings on the 10602 Rockaway Beach Boulevard rezoning in Queens, the 307 Kent Avenue and 2840 Knapp Street rezonings in Brooklyn, the West 142nd Street rezoning and the Windermere Special Permit in Manhattan, and the proposed citywide zoning tax amendment known as Zoning for Accessibility or ZFA. Before we begin, I will note that as we did in the subcommittee meeting of August 3rd, today we will be accommodating public testimony via Zoom, as well as uh, any members of the public who wish to testify in person. If you are here with us in person and you wish to testify, please fill out a speaker slip with the Sergeant at Arms indicating your full name, project name, or LU number, and whether you're in favor or against the proposal. For those who wish to testify remotely, you must also sign up by registering online. You may do that now by using the Land Use Division register registration link available on the Council's website at council.nyc.gov backslash land use, forward slash land use. Uh, for each of the hearings held today, applicant teams will be called first to testify, followed by members of the public. Uh, the public testimony will be limited to two minutes per witness. If you have additional testimony you would like the subcommittee to consider, or if you have written testimony you would like to submit, instead of appearing here before the subcommittee, you may email it to landusetestimony uh, land at council.nyc.gov. Please indicate the LU number and or project name in the subject line of your email. Anyone wishing to obtain an accessible version of any of the presentations shown today, please send an email request to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. Finally, please note that the logistics of conducting a hybrid hearing may require breaks or pauses as we coordinate everyone's participation. Uh, we ask that you please be patient as we work through any issues. And uh, before we turn uh, to our hearings, we will vote to approve with modifications. LU's uh, 826, 827 for the 840 Atlantic Avenue rezoning proposal relating to property in Majority Leader Cumbo's district in Brooklyn, uh, which was heard by the subcommittee at our August 3rd meeting. The proposal seeks a zoning map amendment and a related zoning text amendment to facilitate the development of a new mixed use residential development with commercial and community facility space. Our modification will establish transition areas down from this unique corner site the, original, uh, the originally proposed C6 3X zoning district will be maintained only at the corner of the two wide streets, Atlantic Avenue and Vanderbilt Avenue. At this site, as this site is uniquely appropriate for higher density. Further east along Atlantic from this corner site, the easternmost 50 feet of the rezoning area will be modified to a C6 C6 2A district to establish consistency with the M Crown Community Plan framework developed in cooperation between Community Board 8 and the Department of City Planning. 
That framework calls for higher density specifically at the corner of Vanderbilt and Atlantic Avenue, which is in close proximity of the high density Pacific Park development to the west, along with the lower density going along uh, going east along the Atlantic corridor to match the medium density character of Bedford Stuyvesant and Crown Heights. On Vanderbilt Avenue, the southern portion of the rezoning area will be modified to a C63A district to establish a transition to the historic lower density character of Pacific Street and Vanderbilt Avenue to the south, also in line with the M Crown Community Plan framework. In addition to the MIH text amendment will be modified to strike option two and add option one and the deep affordability option. Majority Leader Cumbo is in support of this proposal as modified, and I will read the statement uh, on her behalf. Okay. Uh, I am pleased to state my support for the 840 Atlantic Avenue development and encourage my colleagues to support the application with modifications and commitments from the applicant. 840 Atlantic Avenue presents a rare opportunity to secure truly affordable housing and an affordable long-term home for the beloved local arts organization and job generating commercial space on a site that is currently home only to a parking lot and fast food restaurant. The zoning modification will help better align the application with local community uh, planning goals by establishing uh, transitions away from this high density intersection to the lower density part of the neighborhood. The developer has committed to the following community benefits using the deep affordable MIH option to provide 54 permanently affordable units at 40% uh, percent MI, uh, MI <laughs> AMI for the family making between 30,000 and 50,000. <clears> One second, while we get it back, there we go. 8,000 square feet of permanent affordable space for nonprofit arts organizations which will provide a long-term home for the Jamal Gaines Creative Outlet Dance Company, 50,000 square feet for the commercial space to support local employment opportunities and a mixed-use walk-to-work walk neighborhood. The developer has also come to an agreement with 32BJ to provide good building service jobs and will retain Team Brown Consulting to develop a local hiring and sourcing plan. Uh, I urge my colleagues to support this plan with, the, with these modifications and benefits. I now call for a vote to approve with modifications uh, I have described, LUs 826 and 827 for the 840 Atlantic Avenue rezoning. Council, uh, please call the roll. Chair Moya. I vote aye. Council Member Reynoso. I vote aye. Council Member Gordenchik. Before me. Yeah. Aye. Council Member Ayala. I vote aye. Council Member Rivera. I vote aye. Council Member Borelli. I vote aye. Chair, the vote is currently six in the affirmative, zero in the negative, with no abstentions. The vote will remain open. Okay, thank you. Uh, I now open the public hearing on LU 834 for the Windermere proposal seeking a zoning special permit and relating to property in Speaker Johnson's district in Manhattan. I will uh, remind the viewing public for anyone wishing to testify remotely on this item, if you have not already done so, you must register online and you may do that now by visiting the council website. If you're here today in person and wish to testify, please see the Sergeant at Arms to fill out a, uh, and submit a speaker card. Uh, the first panel for this item includes uh, James Power, uh, Land Use Counsel for the applicant, along with uh, Mark Tress and uh, Nicholas Chalco, Chalco for, for the applicant. This applicant panel will be testifying remotely, so I will now ask that they be unmuted and counsel if you would please administer the affirmation. Panelists, please raise your right hands and state your name for the record. James Tower. Nicholas Jelko. Mark Tress. 
Thank you. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth uh, in your testimony before the subcommittee and in answer to all council member questions? I do. I do. Thank you. Thank you. We have received your slideshow presentation for this proposal. Uh, when you are ready to present it, please say so, and it will be displayed on screen by our staff. And the slides will be advanced when you say next. As a reminder for the viewing public, if you need an accessible version of this presentation, please send an email request to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. And now, Mr. Power, uh, you and your team uh, may begin. Oh, thank you very much. Good morning. I'm Jim Power from Kramer 11. As noted, I'm joined by our client, Mark Tress from Cedar Holdings and Nick Chelko from MA Architects. Mark would first like to say a few words about the project. Mark. Hi, good morning to all and thank you everybody for your uh, precious time. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to, to be spend time with everybody and see you all. Um, myself, my colleagues and I believe everybody else on this Zoom webinar has been anxiously anticipating this project's uh, completion. Uh, it's been nothing but an eyesore uh, for the city and the city council in particular. The building, although it's a glorious building by nature, had a checkered, a checkered history. And we, we are very proud to be able to be here today and restore the glory of the building to the, uh, um, make the city proud and let the building really shine and let the people of Manhattan and the surrounding areas enjoy this gem uh, that was at one point looked like a rough, but really it's a, it's a, it's a diamond. And we're proud to be here and we're, ha we're happy that the city council has uh, agreed to hear our application, understand the trials and tribulations that it took us to get here almost 10, 10 long years right now. But thank you all. And I guess we are uh, looking forward to meeting you at the ribbon cutting ceremony. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. So this application, uh, ne next slide, please. Can you advance the slide. Yeah, next slide after that, please. Next slide after that, please. This application concerns the Windermere, a landmark building at the southwest corner of 57th Street and 9th Avenue. It is located in the Clinton District and partially in the preservation area. The application seeks a Section 74 711 special permit to modify a series of regulations and allow the conversion and, and enlargement of the building for commercial use. Next slide, please. Going back through some of the history of the building, our client acquired the property in 2009. It was in disrepair and there was an extensive restoration program done pursuant to a series of approvals by the Landmarks Commission. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. There had been an unfortunate history of harassment by the prior owner of the building, which led to a cure agreement with HPD. Under that agreement, 20 affordable apartments will be provided in the converted building with a separate entrance on 57th Street. The units would be affordable at rents not to exceed 80% of AMI. They would, they would be administered by the Met Council on Jewish Poverty. Getting back to this application, through the special permit, the building would be converted for either transient hotel or office use the, applicant, the application proposes two alternate schemes, both with ground floor retail and restaurant use on the top floor. With that, I will turn it over to Nick to review the use and bulk waivers and restoration program in more detail. Nick, are you there? Hello, Nick. I can't hear you. There we go. Thank you. Oh, sure, sure. Sorry, I was on mute there. Great. Um, 
So th this application is 74 of 711, uh, which uh, as you may know, it's, it's primarily to restore the building. Um, it's an individual landmark. Um, and then as Jim mentioned, there's use and bulk waivers uh, associated with that restoration. So I'd like to present to you uh, some of uh, what we've been presenting you know, to landmarks and, uh, and the, the, the local community. Um, and, and so you get a sense of, of what we're doing to restore the building and then um, also the, the, the use and bulk waivers that are proposed. This is an individual landmark built in 1880, oldest known large apartment complex in Council District 3. It's really presumed the second oldest in New York City. Um, so as Jim mentioned, it's, it's uh, adaptive reuse, 80,000 square feet, but there's also 20 affordable apartments uh, per, per the cure agreement, agreement that Jim mentioned, and I'll show you where those are. Um, hotel use or office use is the primary uh, proposal uh, for the upper levels of the building. Um, also active ground floor use, new barrier free access and uh, rooftop access for those residents that we mentioned next. These are the images that we had access to really of, of the early years of the building and were influential in um, the proposed design and, and restoration. Uh, and and you'll, you'll see their influence in later slides, but um, on the image on the left, the, those uh, masonry porticos, the wood projecting storefront, that wood cornice, most of that was either completely um, removed uh, throughout time or, or it, it just deteriorated beyond recognition. Um, so these images were important and reference points for us. Uh, next. And this was the building Mark mentioned, you know, 10 years ago, this process really started. This was the building at that time. Next. Uh, so the proposed restoration is quite extensive under 74, 711. Um, and, and I'll just quickly list uh, a few of those items. It, it, internally, it was important to stabilize the building. Um, it had wood floor, uh, wood joists. So that was all removed and replaced with steel and concrete. Um, so structurally, this building is, is now uh, restored uh, and ready to stand for uh, you know, another 150 years. Uh, and then there was also a lot of cosmetic work. So cleaning, uh, repairing brick and stone masonry, replacing the windows to match all, all to match historic um, uh, specifications, new storefront, wood store, wood storefront, the double portico um, to match the, the one that you just saw in the photo, um, as well as repairing the existing porticos that you can see on the street today, um, and then replacing all the all the metal um, iron work, um, cornice, um, and all that to match historic uh, conditions. Next, a little side by side for the two street elevations that you can see. The, the drawing on the left is where it was, and the drawing on the right is the proposal. Really, you see a lot of the work on the ground floor in these drawings, so you can see the porticos reestablished and the storefront reestablished. Next. And here on Ninth Avenue, again, that storefront was completely removed um, over time, so, so reestablishing that storefront and then um, repointing all the brick uh, and restoring the facades. We'll show you some, some current images with that restoration in a minute. Next. And then the other piece of this uh, is adaptive reuse. So throughout the building, it was SRO um, and, and now will be commercial for the most part. But on the image on the right, there's a pink outline of the 57th Street facade. That's, that's outlining where the residential portion will be. There'll be, um, you know, since, since the building is both commercial use uh, with its entrance on 9th Avenue and residential use, um, the residential, the residents will have their, their own lobby, their own entrance, their own elevator, their own stairs, um, so, that, so that there's no crossing between the two uh, commercial and residential uses. Um, so the other big piece of this is, um, besides the, the use, um, is to uh, enlarge the building. It has quite a high parapet. So um, the current eighth floor is, is shown in green, but the proposal um, is to uh, fill out that eighth floor. So that's the yellow. And then um, a ninth floor addition is shown in orange. Um, and that's you know, to give uh, roof access um, for the residents and also uh, views from within uh, for the commercial users to occupy that ninth floor. Um, 
will be will be a great use of, of space. Next, Landmark's primarily is concerned with, uh, was concerned with the uh, visibility of that proposed bulk. You see it, uh, so Nicholas, we did these studies. Nicholas, if you could just speak a little closer to the microphone, because we- Sure. You're fading out, thank you. Sure, yeah. So Landmark's was uh, primarily concerned with, uh, with what you could see of that, of that new proposal uh, above the uh, historic cornice. So we did these view studies. You see one here. We're trying to minimize what you would see. Uh, next. And you see here, uh, this is over a secondary facade, so a lot line facade, but we were still sensitive to what you could see um, over the, the sort of historic face of the building. So we, we, the, you know, the ninth floor from that, uh, from the overview, you saw, you know, everything is set back um, from the facade. Okay, next. So in this image, this, this shows uh, the section through the building to describe the location of the commercial uses. Uh, again, we're carrying two options here on the left hotel, on the right is office. Um, and then on the ninth floor would be a restaurant. Next, to review the zoning waivers, uh, there's a, most of the waivers are, the bulk waivers I should say, have to do with the fact that it's an existing building um, and it predates zoning. So it, it's to make the existing building itself compliant with zoning. Um, so those waivers are, um, are uh, an exceedance of the maximum street wall height of 85 feet, um, an encroachment on the sky exposure plane that's shown in D. It's actually shown better in a section that, that I'll show you in a minute. Uh, but this view, the plan view is good to see uh, the courts. There's, there's small courts that are, were historically uh, part of the building and were, and were used for, for daylight. So it, these waivers will make those courts um, comply with zoning. Uh, next. And here you see uh, bubble D there. Um, that's, that's existing height of the building, but it doesn't conform with current zoning. So we need a waiver there. Whereas uh, item B really is highlighting the restaurant uh, on the ninth floor. That does comply with the bulk regulations, but the use of the building um, from the, where you see the bubble A and up is commercial use, which doesn't comply with the use regulations and is a requested waiver. Next. And this is just another section through the building to show uh, the location of those use regulations. Uh, next. So the current status, this is the image of the building today. You can see there's still a lot of work to do on the ground floor, but we've done a lot of the restoration work. Uh, the structure is stabilized. So everything within the building um, is stabilized. Uh, street facade cornice restoration is complete. Multi-story scaffolding is removed. It was up there for many years uh, for repointing and cleaning. Uh, but that's all been done. Portico and storefront area way restoration is in progress, it's underway. Um, and the 7471 appli application was certified for public review April 5th, CB4 approved with conditions on June 2nd of this year, and CBC approved with conditions on August 18th of this year. So I'll turn it back over to Jim Power. Yeah, so finally, just to wrap up, uh, next slide, please. We'll just go through the uh, issues raised by Community Community Board 4. Uh, we are continuing discussions with the Met Council about the age limits on the affordable units. We will be providing a 50% community preference uh, consistent for the affordable units consistent with HPD policy. We are exploring options for increased ADA accessibility. We will provide the requested roof barrier, triple glazed windows, and address the building's history in the lobby. And finally, as approved by CPC, there would be no outdoor dining associated with the restaurant. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of questions here. Um, the borough president recommended a, a preference for a local uh, community members and the diversity of residents for the affordable units. Has the applicant team been able to address that request? Yes, we have engaged with HPD about that and we will be providing a 50% uh, 
preference for community board for residents as well as uh, preferences for visually and uh, hearing impaired and uh, civil service workers consistent with HPD policy. And the borough president also indicated a preference for the commercial space uh, to be a hotel. Uh, has the applicant decided whether the building will be used for a hotel or for office space? That decision has not yet been made. Mark, would you like to comment on that? Like I said, right now, the decision has not been final, but we are uh, leaning towards a hotel. But it's not been confirmed thus far. And, and when do you think you're going to be coming to that decision? We really, it should, there are a number of business factors that, that, that play into that role. So hopefully sooner than later, as this project has uh, antiquated itself. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's it uh, for me with the questions. I will now uh, turn it over to any of my colleagues who may have any questions for this panel. There, uh, there being no further questions, uh, the applicant panel is excused. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, if there's any members of the public who wish to testify on the Windermere special permit proposal, please press the raise hand button now, or for those here in the chamber, please see the sergeant at arms now to prepare a speaker card, and the meeting will briefly stand at ease. There being no other members of the public who wish to testify on LU 834 for the proposed Windermere special permit, the public hearing on this item is now closed and it is laid over. I'm gonna now turn it over to our council. Uh, thank you, Chair. On a continuing vote of the land use items, Council Member Levin. I don't know. Vote of seven in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. The items are uh, adopted and, and referred to the full land use committee. Thank you. Uh, now I open the public hearing on LU number 839 for the 10602 Rockaway Beach Boulevard rezoning proposal, seeking a zoning map amendment and relating to property in Council Member Ulrich's district in Queens. I will remind the viewing public for anyone wishing to testify remotely on this item. If you have not already done so, you must register online and you may do that now by visiting the council's website. If you are here today in person and wish to testify, please see the Sergeant at Arms to fill out and submit a speaker card. Uh, the first panel for this item includes Richard Lobel, uh, Amanda Ioniti, Dino Tomasi, and Victor Filetti, appearing for the applicant. Uh, this applicant team will be testifying remotely, so I will now ask that they be unmuted. And counsel, if you would please administer the affirmation. Panelists, please raise your right hand and state your name for the record. Victor Filetti. Richard Lobel. Amanda Ionati. Go ahead, Amanda. Amanda Ionati. Dino Thomas Fetty. Thank you. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee in an answer to all council member questions? I do. I do. do. Thank you. I do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have received your slideshow presentation for this proposal. Uh, when you are ready to present, please say so, and it will be displayed on screen by our staff, and slides will be advanced when you say next. As a reminder for the viewing public, if you need an accessible version of this presentation, please send an email request to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. 
And now, uh, Mr. Lobel, uh, you and your team uh, may begin. Thank you, Chair Moya. Good morning and good morning to members of the subcommittee. Once again, Richard Lobel of Sheldon Lobel PC for the applicant. If you can please load the slideshow. Uh, while that is done, I am joined today by Dino Tomasetti, the applicant for this project, Victor Folletti, who is the project architect, and Amanda Iannotti of my office. You see before you the presentation for 10602 Rockaway Beach Boulevard. Next slide. The proposed rezoning will rezone uh, all or portions of five lots from an R5D to a C2, from, from an R5D C23 zoning district to an M13 zoning district. The rezoning will have the effect of two things. The first is to create a, a six story and cellar self storage facility. And the second is to create a parking garage beneath the storage facility to allow for 83 cars. The storage would be on floors one through six with accessory parking and loading docks on the ground floor. The public parking garage would be below in the cellar. Next slide. This application was the result of many community conversations over the last several years. Uh, there were meetings with both Community Board 14 as well as the Rockaway Beach Civic. Uh, the community initially expressed support for the project, uh, but did note that they would like parking beneath the facility to accommodate beachgoers during the summer months. Uh, or as, as originally proposed, this complied with parking requirements without providing any seller parking. So with that in mind, the applicant went back to the drawing board and at cost to the project is now able to provide 83 spaces in the cellar. So in the most recent meetings with both the Land Use Committee and the Civic, the members expressed support for the proposal. They found the context of the proposal at six stories to be appropriate, given both the 13 story residential towers to the south, as well as the wastewater treatment facility and large wastewater towers to the north. Uh, they appreciated the 83 parking spaces again, and they also discussed the need for self-storage in this area of the Rockaways where there's almost no facilities available, particularly ones that are flood-proofed uh, in the interest of protecting uh, goods and items for families who are uh, you know, at, at risk to flooding. Um, in addition to that, the applicant here made commitments to local hiring, to hiring uh, local hiring for long-term employees, as well as typical discounts for seniors, veterans, and youth organizations. Next slide. So the next slide shows the zoning map. Again, this would involve uh, the rezoning of this area from an R5D C23 to an M13. Uh, the applicant's property is towards the eastern portion of the proposed rezoning area. And again, this is deemed appropriate given the 13 story towers to the south of Rockaway Beach Boulevard and the wastewater treatment facility to the north of the freeway. Next slide. This is merely a tax map demonstrating the extent of the rezoning. You can see the area of the applicant's property in red. There's an adjacent lot to be included in the rezoning, lot one. Uh, this currently houses a Walgreens, which will continue to be conforming under the proposed rezoning. Next slide. So with this slide, we have a land use map and photos that follow it. And then there's going to be uh, the project rendering and plans. So I'm just gonna briefly just look at this land use map, uh, and we would note that there are uh, higher districts, higher density districts that have been rezoned in the area, including an R68 in the southwest of the development site. Uh, and again, we note that particularly given the street access here and the surrounding M11 use, as well as M21 district, uh, both the, the city planning felt this to be particularly appropriate. Uh, as Amanda pages through the photos, which gives some flavor of the surrounding area, uh, we would note that we've had fantastic support. Oh, I'm sorry, if you could just, uh, I'm sorry, I know Amanda's not doing it. If you could just forward the slides to the project rendering. Thank you. Um, we would note that Community Board 14, Queen, the Queensborough President and the City Planning Commission have all approved this application uh, and have viewed this as something which is sorely needed in the area. With that, I would defer to Victor Folletti, who can briefly run through the plans and then we'd be happy to answer any questions. Good afternoon. So uh, first, first slide we have is the uh, rendering of the exterior of the proposed self-storage building. Uh, again, a six story with a uh, cellar. Uh, this uh, slide here shows the uh, main entrance to the building, uh, handicapped accessible and with windows viewing into the facility. Uh, next slide. Um, the adjacent uh, facade uh, showing the uh, proposed parking entrance 
as well as additional windows viewing into the facility as well. Next slide. An aerial view showing our building uh, in proximity to uh, the surrounding area, uh, showing the wastewater treatment plant uh, adjacent to this property and uh, across the street, the uh, multi-level uh, residential building across the street. Next slide. Uh, site plan with zoning analysis showing the new six-story self-storage building on the site. Um, it also shows the two curb cut access uh, points, one to the parking garage and one to the loading for the uh, self-storage facility. Next. Proposed seller plan for a uh, tended parking garage. Um, it's pretty much laid out, all open plan uh, for attendants to park uh, vehicles for the public. Next slide. This is the main level or first floor plan, main level entrance to the self-storage facility, as well as uh, some accessory parking for the self-storage facility and the uh, entrance ramp to the uh, public parking garage. The uh, retail portion of the self-storage facility as well. Thank you. Next. Uh, second through sixth floor is a typical plan for self-storage, uh, which would be accessed uh, through the two main elevators and uh, provided with two egress stairs as per code. Next, a height diagram showing the building is within uh, the sky exposure for uh, this district. Next. I believe that ends the last one, sorry. That's okay. Thank you, uh, thank you. and th Chair Moya, with that, we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, I just have one question, uh, and I might have missed it, so I apologize if I did, but uh, do you still plan to build uh, the public parking garage? We do, um, and the, uh, the public parking garage will, as built, be able to accommodate 83 spaces. This would be attended parking, um, a huge benefit to the local area uh, where many um, residents complain of, of congestion and in parking uh, during the summer months. So we're really happy to provide it. Uh, it's been a wonderful project and we've really worked closely with Queen, Queens Community Board 14. And have you identified any potential parking operators? Currently, no. Um, I know that, uh, you know, in our conversations with the Community Board, um, we discussed the fact that the parking garage here is not really central to the business. Uh, Mr. Tomasetti uh, is in the business of self-storage and similar projects. So um, the idea here would be to find an operator and to, um, you know, to, to basically charge, um, you know, the lower, lowest rates of the area uh, so that really we can just get cars off the streets and provide this amenity. It's, you know, the, the truth here is that the operations of the self-storage facility are what's important to the operator. The parking will merely operate as a, as a neighborhood amenity. I've got it. Okay, that's it for me. Um, I now uh, want to invite any of my colleagues uh, to ask any questions to this panel. That's it. Uh, there being no further questions, uh, the applicant panel is excused. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Thank uh, you. It, if thank there you. Are, thank you thank you so much uh, if there are any members of the public who wish to testify uh, on the 10602 rockaway beach boulevard rezoning proposal please please press the raise hand button now or for those here in the chamber please see the sergeant now uh, the, the sergeants now to prepare a speaker card and the meeting will briefly uh, stand at ease Thank you. Um, there being no uh, other members of the public who wish to testify on LU number 839 for the 10602 Rockaway Beach Boulevard rezoning proposal, the public hearing is now closed and the item is laid over. Uh, I now open the public hearing on LU numbers, uh, numbers 840 and 841 for the 307 
10th Avenue rezoning proposals uh, seeking a zoning map amendment and a related zoning text amendment and relating to property in council member Levin's district in Brooklyn. Once again, for anyone wishing to testify remotely on this item, if you have not already done so, you must register online and you may do that now by visiting the council's website. If you are here uh, today in person and wish to testify, please see the Sergeant at Arms to fill out and submit a speaker card. Council member. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. No, I, I, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to um, hear the applicant um, this morning. And uh, we've been in discussions for the better part of six years, five, six years on, on, this, uh, on this parcel. So um, I appreciate all the hard work that's gone into it. And, uh, I look forward to uh, having a dialogue this morning. Thank you. Thank you, uh, council member. The, the first panel on this item includes Judy Gatland, uh, land use counsel for the applicant and uh, Luis Silverman and Lily Blank as the property owners. We also have Jared uh, Bernstein and Lisa Lau on hand for, uh, for Q&A as needed. This applicant team will be testifying remotely, so I will now ask that they be unmuted. And council, if you would please uh, administer the affirmation. Panelists, please raise your right hands and state your name for the record. Lily Blank. Judy Gallon. Lily Blank. Do we have Lisa Lau? Or Jared Bernstein? Okay. Uh, is Lisa Lau and uh, Jared, Jared Bernstein. Bernstein? Okay. Uh, panelists, do you, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and an answer to all council member questions? I do. I do. I do. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have received your slideshow presentation for this proposal. When you are uh, ready to present it, please say so and it will be displayed on screen by our staff and the slides will be advanced when you say next. As a reminder to the viewing public, if you need an accessible version of this presentation, please send an email request to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. And now uh, Ms. Gatlin, uh, you and your team may begin. Good morning, Chair Moya, members of the subcommittee. I'm Judy Gallant from Brian Cave, Leighton Paisner, Land Use Council to the applicant. I'm joined today by Lily Blank and Lewis Silverman. They are representatives of the owner of the site. Um, Lewis and Lily will make brief remarks and then I will return and take the committee through the application. Lily? Hi. Good morning, Chair Moya and the members of the subcommittee. My name is Lily Blank and I'm one of the owners of 307 Kent Avenue. I am also a psychologist in community and private practice. My father ran a wholesale distributing business out of 307 Kent for the mid, from the mid-60s to the late 80s, and I worked there after school and over summers for many years. I remember when Domino Sugar and the Schaefer Brewery were fully functional factories. Kent Avenue smelled like beer in those days, and I joked that I knew what a beer smelled like long before I ever tasted it. My father eventually purchased the building with my partner, Louis Silverman's father, who owned and operated a trucking company up the street where my father leased his trucks. After my father closed his business, we rented 307 Kent to City Meals on Wheels for many years. They were wonderful tenants and we had a great relationship with them. But several years ago, they told us that they would not be renewing their lease, explaining that the type of business they operated which was reliant on large trucks running up and down Kent Avenue, as my father's business had been, was no longer viable in the neighborhood as it was evolving from a manufacturing area to a residential area. It was at this point that Lewis and I began to consider a rezoning. We wanted to build something that would support the community and provide opportunities for work, and we reached out to many community leaders and members for guidance. Pre-COVID, we decided on a building that would cater to those who wanted to work close to home, to bike and walk to work. If my clinical practice is any indication, post-COVID people will likely adopt a hybrid work model where having an office close to home is an even more appealing option. Thank you, Chair Moya and members of the subcommittee for your time. 
My partner, Louis Silverman, will now introduce himself. Good morning, Chair Moya and the members of the subcommittee. My name is Louis Silverman. I'm a partner in 307 Kent Associates. I've been, I have a long history with the site and the neighborhood as my family and I operated a business down the block starting in the 1960s and purchased 307 Kent Avenue in 1986 with Lily's father. Since then, we've maintained our involvement <coughs> and investment in, in the neighborhood with operating real estate and small businesses in the area. This area of Williamsburg has changed significantly over the years. Heavy industrial businesses have left, residents have moved in. Against this ba backdrop, we are pursuing a rezoning that would allow 307 Kent to be developed for its uses that are more appropriate for the surrounding area today. Rather than adding more apartments to the area, we feel the neighborhood would benefit from an office building that would serve the existing residents of the area. We're proposing an M15 because it allows for office, light industrial, medical office, and ground floor retail uses. We feel our building will help build Williamsburg into a true live, work, play community. We of course recognize that COVID has changed the world. We do think that COVID, we do not think that COVID has eliminated the need for office space Rather, it has and will continue to change how businesses and people interact with their offices. We believe businesses and medical providers will seek new and additional locations with smaller footprints that are located closer to where their employees and patients live. Our proposed zoning is intended to accommodate these users. Throughout this process, we've gathered a lot of feedback, support, questions, and comments from key stakeholders and community members. To give you some specifics, we are partnering with St. Nick's Alliance to support its construction training programs and have pledged to make construction jobs available to local residents. We have an ongoing dialogue with Evergreen Exchange on how light industrial users fit into the neighborhood today and how best to accommodate them. We have received several letters of support which will be submitted for the record. Thank you again, Chair Moya and members of the subcommittee for your time. Our land use lawyer, Judy Gallant, will now explain our application. Good morning again, Chair Moya and members of the community. May I have the slides presentation, please? Next slide, please. This is an application to rezone 307 Kent Avenue from an M31 district to an M15 district to facilitate the construction of a nine story building that would accommodate offices, retail, light manufacturing and community facility uses. The application also requests the mapping of an M14R6A mixed use district and the establishment of an MIH area over property adjacent to the development site. Next site, slide please. The rezoning area is located on the western portion of the block that's bounded by Kent Avenue on the west, Wyeth on the east, South 2nd on the north and South 3rd on the south. Um, here you can see the development site, which is located at the corner of South 3rd Street and Kent Avenue and its surrounding context. The Domino Buildings and Domino Park to the west, northwest, and southwest, the Williamsburg Bridge to the south, and Grand Prairie Park to the north. Next slide. The site is a 14,425 square foot lot that's currently developed with a single story warehouse building shown here. The application proposes to rezone the site from an M31 heavy industrial district to an M15 light industrial district because, as Lily explained, the neighborhood around the site has changed from a manufacturing area to an increasingly mixed use residential area, as you'll see from the following slides. Next slide, please. West of the site across Kent Avenue is the Domino Refinery Building, part of the five block Domino campus that was rezoned in 2010 from M31, the same district that the site is located in today. The refinery is being enlarged and converted to office use. To the south, across South 3rd Street from the development site is the Domino Upland Building at 325 Kent Avenue, which is a 15 story residential building with ground floor retail shown in the photo on the right. Next slide, please. On the left um, is another view of 25 Kent, the large building in the distance, um, uh, the Upland building, 15 stories residential across Kent Avenue to A Kent, which you can't see from the photo on the right, um, uh, it's under construction, will contain a 680 dwelling units, a new elementary school and parking. And further north shown on the right photo is another domino building, 260 Kent, which is two towers, 
containing residential, commercial, and retail uses, which is now completed and occupied. In total, Domino will contain 2,300 dwelling units and approximately 480,000 square feet of commercial space, really transforming the area from a heavy manufacturing district to a mixed use community. Next slide. In addition to the Domino residential buildings in the area, there's also residential use adjacent to 307 Kent, as well as on the balance of the project block, much of which is already mapped within an MX district that permits residential use. Shown here are two residential condominium buildings fronting on South 2nd and South 3rd Street adjacent to the site, which were developed pursuant to a 2005 DSA variant, which permitted residential use in the manufacturing zone. Next slide, please. The land use map here illustrates the mixed use nature of the neighborhood today, which continues to move away from its industrial past. The prevalent red, yellow, and peach are commercial residential and mixed use buildings, and the less prevalent purple is industrial use. Next slide, please. The existing M3 district shown here in peach is currently limited to portions of three blocks extending from South 3rd Street on the south to Grand Street on the north having been reduced over time as a result of multiple rezoning so that today the remnants of the M3 district, including the site, are entirely surrounded by districts that permit residential use as of right. As you know, M3 zoning is intended for heavy industrial uses that generate noise, traffic, pollutants, um, and these districts are intended to be and typically are located at a distance from residential areas. Next slide, please. The proposed rezoning area consists of five lots and two partial lots. It would map an M15 district over the western portion of the block, extending 120 feet from Kent Avenue. It would also include a 90-foot westward extension of the MX special mixed-use district found on the eastern end of the block to meet the proposed M15 district. And finally, it would establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area over the portion of the block that would be newly added to the MX district where residential use is allowed. Next slide, please. The proposed M15 district is the light manufacturing district that permits industrial uses that meet the strictest performance standards in a zoning resolution, as well as office, retail, and very limited community facility uses. The maximum FAR for commercial and manufacturing use is five. The maximum FAR for community facility use is 6.5 and the maximum total FAR for community facility is included is 6.5. The maximum street wall height is 85 feet, after which the building must step back 20 feet on both Kent and South Third Street, which are narrow streets, and then the building may rise under a sky exposure plane of 2.7 to 1. Next slide, please. This is an illustrative rendering of the nine-story building, uh, approximately 6.5 FAR that could be constructed under the proposed rezoning. It would contain up to 93,000 square feet of floor area consisting of office, light industrial, community facility, and ground floor retail. The base would set back five feet from the property line on 10th Avenue to provide a sidewalk widening area for enhanced pedestrian circulation. Um, the building would then rise to five stories, 85 feet above the street line, set back another 20 feet from 10th Avenue and 25 feet on South 3rd Street to a total height of approximately 151 feet. Next slide, please. Well, we believe that the proposed rezoning offers a number of benefits. It would bring office, community facility, and retail uses that would support the surrounding um, emerging and, and very prevalent already residential development and would be more consistent with those uses um, than the existing M3 zoning. It would also require any industrial uses that do locate in the building to meet the high performance standards that are more consistent with residential use than M3 regulations would uh, require. It would also result in uses that activate the street um, and enhance the site's engagement with the surrounding area um, and would bring jobs to the Williamsburg area. The EIS projects 523 incremental jobs that would be brought to the area um, that would enhance the local economy and provide opportunities for residents to work near where they live as well as tax revenues. Community Board 1 voted to approve the rezoning by a vote of 25 to 5 to 1 uh, without conditions on a report from the Land Use Committee uh, unanimously recommending approval of the rezoning. Borough President Adams recommended approval with conditions and the City Planning Commission voted unanimously in favor of rezoning on September 1st without conditions. 
we're happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank, thank you. Uh, before I turn it over to the councilman, I just have a couple of quick questions for you. Uh, this application states that the proposed development will be uh, predominantly office space. Uh, have you looked at alternative development scenarios uh, with uh, this flexible zoning? Um, the, the anticipation and the concept behind the project was to provide um, office and sort of flex space for companies that want to have employees that live and work in close proximity. Um, the zoning itself, however, is quite flexible with limitations. Um, obviously, residential use is not allowed in an M1 zone. There are some limited community facility uses that are allowed, such as medical office, um, and then commercial uses like office and light industrial uses. So the rezoning would allow any of those uses to locate in the building, as it's a, it's a rezoning, not a, uh, a special permit or anything. The, the rezoning would allow any of those uses to locate in the building. Okay. Uh, could the building be taller than proposed? And if yes, are you willing to commit to the building envelope as presented today? Um, the building, there is no height limit in an M15 district. It is not a contextual district, so there's no height limit. Um, the building rises under a sky exposure plane. At some point, though, the way sky exposure plane works, the floors become too inefficient to be built. Um, they get too small as they step back under the sky exposure plane. So, and at, at 100 and approximately 151 feet, as shown in the illustrative rendering, the floor area, the maximum floor area can be fit. Um, I will leave it to the developer to discuss whether there's a, to be a commitment um, to, to maintain that height. Okay. Um, and also, when it comes to good jobs and local hiring, uh, do you have a plan in place to address uh, local hiring during construction? Uh, and how many local hires would typically be involved in a project like this? Louis, do you want to discuss your discussions with St. Nick and 32BJ? Sorry, can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah, we, we've partnered with St. Nick's um, to support construction training programs for, for locals. So that's already in place and we've spent time with them for this project. But do you know how many local hires would typically be involved in a project like this? Um, it, it depends. I mean, we're, we're, we've spoken to them and they've got you know, a handful. It's not, a, it's not a very large building. Okay. Uh, if you could at some point get that number to me, that'd be great. Sure. Okay. Uh, that's it for me. Uh, I want to uh, now turn it over to Council Member uh, Levin uh, for questions. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, hi, uh, everybody. Um, nice to see you. Um, so uh, I wanted to ask um, a couple of questions. First, about about parking. I, um, what's the what's the um, parking framework um, under the proposed zoning action? Parking is not required, and parking will not be provided. Okay. So the, so the 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 goal is to is to minimize or eliminate parking uh, entirely. Is that correct? Uh, sorry, is the goal is to zoning and it's not anticipated to be provided either. I'm sorry, I have, I'm having a little trouble hearing Judith. Can you say that a little louder? I, parking is not required under M15 zoning and there is no, at this time, there's no expectation of providing parking. There will be bicycle parking. Again, the idea being that um, the attraction here would be to have people who live in the neighborhood uh, bike or walk to work. Okay, that's good. Um, um, in some of our prior discussions, we discussed the, the issue about um, lot line windows with neighboring buildings. Can you speak a little bit to that issue? Yes. Um, 
and you know, um, lot line windows that aren't benefited by uh, a light and air easement don't have legal protection in the event of development on an adjacent lot. Um, there are nine lot line windows in the west facing wall of 29 South 3rd Street that would have to be closed as a result of the construction of the project because they aren't benefited by any kind of easement. They have no legal protection. Um, because those windows were constructed on the lot line when the condominium was constructed, they cannot be used for legal light and air. In other words, each of the rooms that has one of those lot line windows on it must also have another legal window for uh, legal light and air. So the, the, um, the construction of the building wouldn't be closed off a sole source of light to any, quote, living room, any room that's a living room under the multiple dwelling law. And the fact that these are lot line windows and that they can't be used for legal light and air was disclosed in the condominium offering plan as it, as it was required to be. Um, we also want to note that under existing zoning, under the existing M3 zoning, the same lot line windows could be blocked today by building constructed as of right. So, so by an as of right development, you said? Yes, that's okay. correct. Um, do you know how many, uh, how many apartments that would be impacting? I don't know the number of apartments, but I do know the, uh, the number of windows, as I said, is nine. Okay. Um, and then, uh, it, it might be that it's just, it might be three, but I can't be a hundred percent okay. sure of that. Um, the neighbors did not, we reached out to the neighbors on a number of occasions throughout this rather lengthy process, but we didn't really get, um, and much response. So we don't, we don't know what their floor plans are. And it would just be the one, one building that it would impact or, or more than one? It, it's 29 South that would be. Say that once more. I'm sorry, Judith. I'm having a little time. Sure. It's just 29 South 30th Street from, from the, uh, okay. what I understand from our architect. Okay. Okay. Um, and then I wanted to ask about, um, I want to ask about the borough president's recommendations, um, which were, he, the borough president approved with, um, with, my, uh, with, with, with recommendations. Um, and uh, one of the provisions, one of the recommendations is ensuring adequate provision of space for innovation and maker jobs. So um, uh, uh, urging uh, you as the applicant to include um, some provision of light manufacturing or space for innovation and maker jobs. So um, uh, using as an example, the IBIA special permit um, that, and we've talked about this numerous times, but uh, that that's been utilized, um, you know, several blocks to your north in the Williamsburg Greenpoint IBZ. Um, do you have a response to the borough president's recommendation? At first, we're, we're not a special permit. Mm -hmm. we're, in a, we're in a different zone. Um, and, and part of spending time with the community board, one, and listening to what they felt was needed there, along with some of the struggles of putting tenants in those buildings and being vacant and not generating um, jobs and not ge generating tax revenue. Um, and this was pre-COVID. What we're seeing in, and listening to what everybody wants and completely respect um, the borough president's thoughts along with everyone else's, um, but having what we've learned, I think, during COVID is everyone had to be very flexible and make mm -hmm. great changes to the way that we ordinarily did business, just as we're on this call today where we would normally back in the day be in all one room. Um, that being said, um, we, we need flexibility to make sure that this building is successful, um, which we believe is completely different than some of the other spaces that are, that are on the market today. Um, so we just need complete flexibility in order for this to be a success and spending time with the community board and understanding the needs of the neighborhood, we believe this is, this is what fits here. Mm -hmm. Do you, I would do you, just add, go um, ahead. if I could, um, Community Board 1 
explicitly considered prior to the borough president's recommendation, but explicitly considered the idea of imposing a restriction on some portion of the building to have uh, light industrial use. And after discuss discussion, they rejected that idea, um, largely because, not that I'm in their heads, but from the discussion, uh, they understood the need for flexibility and their gravest concern was of vacancy and failure, something that they say they see in their neighborhood and they did not want to tie the developer's hands to commit to uh, particular types of uses that may or may not be available in the future when this building is built and ready to be leased um, and therefore condemning part of the building to being vacant. That was not um, something that they wanted to do. And so someone raised it and it was that, that condition was turned down. Um, I would also add that this property is not located in an IBZ, so it is mm -hmm. not in an area that the city is committed to keeping in industrial use. And the applicant has chosen an M15 zone because it would very much like to have that kind of use in the building. That is really the concept and, it, and the vision of the applicants to have a, that sort of nice mix of, you know, uh, makers and office tenants and, you know, sort of th that, that whole mix of uses. But um, it, it did not feel confident that that would be available when we got through this process. And of course, we've been going through it for so many years, we couldn't have anticipated it would take this long. But um, it's, it, it, I, it shouldn't be, I feel that in, in a way requiring that here is almost a punishment uh, and I don't, I don't mean that industrial use is a punishment, but having that kind of a restriction when they have chosen instead of a commercial district, which is what Domino is, all of those Domino buildings are in commercial districts where manufacturing use cannot locate. This applicant chose a manufacturing district to have the ability to do it, but feel strongly that it would be very difficult to have um, a restriction that requires it. No, I understood. I mean, I, I, I do appreciate that the uh, the applicant would you know would like to or envisions having that kind of mix. I think that from our perspective and as the application is before us and approving it, um, you know we're 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 tasked with trying to figure out how to make sure that 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 actually happens. And so uh, it's certainly not a punishment. I I don't have any interest in in punishing this application in any way. I'm, we're, we're just looking to ensure that we do have that, um, that mix of uses. And, and frankly, you know, w one of the things that, you know, as we're kind of looking at a, a, a post-COVID or um, world in which there's de develop commercial development in New York City, you know, there are some things that you can't do remotely. You can't make things remotely. Um, and so there will, there will always be a, a need for space, commercial space, in which um, things are, are fabricated or made. And you know, I think the, 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 the world of fabrication or design is different than it was 30 years ago and a lot more technology and 3D printers and you know, we're not talking about like die cutters anymore. Uh, you know, the, 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 the uses of light manufacturing are, um, you know, uh, less of an impact, less of a footprint, um, uh, less of a nuisance to neighbors, less noise, um, you know, and, and, and just of a different character. So in any event, um, I understand your position because, and just, you know, for full disclosure, we've, we've had a version of this conversation for a number of years. So um, uh, uh, let's, let's put a pin in the issue and uh, continue the conversation uh, in the coming days. Um, uh, uh, and I, I hope that we'll be able to arrive at a, you know, a, a satisfactory conclusion um, and, I, and I do just for the record want to express my appreciation for this application going for commercial development. As we all know, ground up commercial development is uh, few and far between in this city. And, um, uh, and it's, um, I, I see it as a, um, uh, as a testament to uh, your client's 
the applicant's uh, belief in the in the future of this city as a as a commercial hub and um, the ability to continue to work here and uh, you know commute locally and be able to um, to be able to do um, you know to achieve our our, our dreams as, as New Yorkers and, and uh, stay in the neighborhood and, and work in the neighborhood and, and create. And so um, I take this as a vote of confidence in New York City's future as an application. So, could, could I add one thing? Uh, sure. we, we, we appreciate um, your input and, and everything that you've just stated. Um, I think it's also, we've made best efforts all along and continue to do so even when designing this building, which is not part of code, we're putting in a freight, a larger freight elevator to accommodate the, the different users, as you put it, mm -hmm. which we completely agree. And as the world has changed over years, it continues to change. And there are many different types of uses that fit, you know, an artificial intelligence, some sort of a small chip manufacturer. There are many different um, variations of light manufacturing. I think where we might have a bit of a difference of a view is we've already committed to being able to work with these types of tenants. But as Judy mentioned earlier, with the way the world changes and, and the way business changes, man, putting a mandatory restriction on on a building of this size where we're already built out to accept that space, it's just not helping, it, it won't do anything other than if there, for some reason, there's more changes and there aren't enough to fill, it handicaps the project from successfully fulfilling all the things that you just mentioned that we agree with you. And we look forward to having another discussion, um, but just for the record, we have built this building with the intent Otherwise, we wouldn't spend the additional money if we were not seriously looking to do it. It wouldn't be just, a, it would be a discussion point, not necessarily a physical attribute of how we've laid out this building to accept it. So I just wanted to put that out there. And thank you, everybody, um, Chairman Moyer and, and the whole subcommittee and, and um, Councilman Levin. We appreciate everybody's uh, help here. Thank you. Thank you, Lewis. And thank you, Lily. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, I now invite any of my colleagues who wish to ask any questions to, to this applicant. Seeing none, uh, there's no further questions. Uh, this panel is now excused. Thank you. The uh, first public panel on this item will include Renzo Ramirez. Zachary Weiner, Bert Nonin, Terry Bennett, Just give us a moment, we're dealing with a little technical uh, issue. Uh, we'll be back shortly.
Okay, I'm just gonna make sure that we uh, have everybody that's on this panel. Renzo Ramirez, Zachary Wiener, Bert Nonen, and Terry Bennett. Okay, we're gonna start with uh, Zachary Wiener. Zachary, are you there? Great, yes, I am. Can you hear me? We can hear you. All right, great. Starting time. Well, thank, okay. First, I wanna thank everyone for uh, letting me speak. Uh, my name is Zach Wiener. I have uh, lived uh, or worked in the Williamsburg neighborhood since 1992. I own property on the north side and have two operating businesses on the south side and 307 Kent pretty much falls right in between them. I support the rezoning proposal and redevelopment located at 307 Ken. I can attest that the rezoning and redevelopment of the property would be a valuable addition to the neighborhood. The area has evolved and changed over the years and I think that 307 Ken project is a logical and valuable extension of the neighborhood's growth. Continuing the heavy industrial use of this property would be damaging to the continued evolution and improvement of our community. Throughout COVID, there have been many vacancies in the area, and I believe space to accommodate smaller office tenants and light industrial uses is appropriate to avoid vacancy, which has plagued our community throughout COVID. Furthermore, I believe the scope of the project will cater to smaller businesses and embody the spirit of Williamsburg while adding a very valuable and much needed product to the market. I'm looking forward to seeing the project's development and excited for the activity it brings, including jobs, job opportunities and new businesses in place of the existing windowless warehouse, which detracts from the vibrancy of the area. I enthous enthusiastically encourage the city council to support 307 Kent's rezoning application. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Uh, we will now go to uh, Terry Bonnet. Starting time. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Uh, my name is uh, Thierry Bonnet. Today I'm lending my voice uh, in support uh, of the 307 Kent application after following the online public hearing and meetings for this uh, proposal held by Community Board 1, the Office of Brooklyn Borough President, and the City Planning Commission. I am a New York City resident since 1987. I've worked in Brooklyn for over 20 years and I lived here for the last 15. I used to be a neighbor right across the street for 10 years, which enabled me to work, live with, and observe closely this very special neighborhood and its residents. I believe that the buildings proposed light use, light industrial and office use is an appropriate fit for this community. It is well adapted and in the continuity of its past and future growth. Reducing commuting time and distances by allowing people to live and work close by will, I think, contribute effectively to resolve serious challenges we face, such as climate change. The scale of the proposed application is, I think, in sync with its surrounding and a new M1 five zoning would I believe serve the community much better than its current heavy manufacturing zoning. I really hope this hearing will support as is this proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Uh, next we have Bert Noonan. 
Starting time. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, my name is Bart, and uh, I wanted to say that I've been a neighbor who, I, I am a neighbor who's been on the block for uh, 20 years and in the neighborhood for over 25 years. Uh, I agree with the previous speaker. I think this is a good application and a proposal for both the block and the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, I think the uh, proposed building being able to accommodate uh, the way it was just described and the way it's been described at all of the other meetings, uh, the mixture of both light industrial and office use uh, is a great fit for the community uh, and will only become more necessary over time as both Brooklyn and the Williamsburg communities continue to grow. Um, I personally applaud them for not going for a residential zoning uh, and also not going for a pure commercial zoning. Um, they're clearly committed to trying to retain the optionality or the flexibility to be able to accommodate the demands of the different types of uh, light industrial or light manufacturing use uh, consistent uh, and parallel with the office use. Uh, and I think from what I saw in their designs, that uh, the ceiling heights, not just the elevators and, and uh, loading dock and, and lack of parking, but the ceiling heights, uh, floor heights, uh, also speak to that because the, those are very tall floors uh, and that allows for a lot of uh, light industrial use. So clearly they, they have a design commitment and a physical commitment to lean in that direction whenever possible. Um, I think the scale of the proposed application reflects a good transition and fits in well with the, the neighboring buildings on the surrounding blocks, both those that are only maybe 15 years old as well as those that go back to over 120 years old. And buildings such as the latter can be found uh, directly west uh, on the block north uh, and to the block south, uh, buildings that go back over 100 years. Um, as well as to the block east, uh, a more recent building, but all of a similar scale. I'm expired. Right. If, if uh, you can, you can you can have a couple more seconds to wrap it up. Okay, I apologize. So, uh, in any event, I think I think it's consistent with the the rest of the community, and I think the proposed zoning is a better fit with the surrounding community, and certainly preferable to the current zoning, uh, as the heavy manufacturing is no longer appropriate for this location. So I, I fully supported Community Board 1 and the subcommittee's unanimous vote uh, and the Community Board's full vote, the Borough President's vote. Um, uh, I, would, I would be more flexible with his Thank suggestions you. on this. Thank you. Thank Brett. you very much. Thank you for your testimony today. Uh, up next, we have Renzo Ramirez. Starting time. We, we seem to have lost uh, Renzo Ramirez. Um, so now I'm just gonna turn it over to colleagues if any of my colleagues have any questions for this panel. Uh, yeah. Chair, I just wanna thank the, this panel for, for their testimony and I appreciate very much and, and my office is available to talk further um, prior to the vote on this application. Thank you. Uh, there being no more questions for this panel, uh, the witness panel is now excused. Uh, as a reminder to, uh, uh, to all of you, written testimony may be sent by email to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. We, we found Renzo Ramirez, uh, so Renzo, uh, whenever you're ready. Starting time. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh,
friend through Ramirez, and I am a member of 32PJ. I am here today on behalf of my union to express our support for the proposed project 307 Camp. 32 BJ supports responsible developers who invest in the community. 307 Kent Street Associates has made an early commitment to creating prevailing wage building service jobs at this site. The developers has a long time partnership with 32 BJ and a track record of creating good jobs throughout their portfolio. We estimate that this will lead to the creation of a number of new building service jobs. We are in full support of this project and we have full confidence that 307 Kent Street Associates will be a, a responsible employer and presence in the community. We know that opportunities for working families to thrive in. On behalf of 30, thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Renzo. Thank you for your uh, testimony uh, today. Uh, if there are any remaining members of the public who wish to testify on the 307 Kent Avenue rezoning proposal, please press the raise hand button now, or for those here in the chamber, please see the Sergeant at Arms to prepare a speaker card, and the meeting will briefly stand at ease. There being no other members of the public who wish to testify on the LU numbers uh, 840 and 841 for the 307 Kent Avenue rezoning proposal, the public hearing is now closed and the items are laid over. Uh, I now open the public hearing on LU numbers 836 and 837 for the 629, 639, West 142nd Street rezoning proposal seeking a zoning map amendment and relating to zoning text amendment and relating to property and council member Levine's district in Manhattan. Once again, for anyone following online and wishing to testify remotely today on this project, you must register online and you may do that now by visiting the council's website. If you are here today in person and wish to testify, please remember to see the Sergeant at Arms to fill out and submit a speaker card. Uh, I now will turn it over to Council Member uh, Levine for uh, some opening remarks. Thank you, Chair Moya, uh, for an opportunity just to very briefly speak on this project. It's located in West Harlem, and for those who don't know the community, there are two really important things you should understand. First of all, this is a community with an incredibly rich architectural heritage that is entwined with the history of this community, and it's a heritage which very much enriches and defines the community today. It's, it's precious to so many of us. Secondly, it's a community with a, a desperate shortage of affordable housing, where there are just countless families who uh, are desperate to find an apartment they can afford uh, or risk landing in homelessness. And so this very much, I think, has shaped how many of us have reacted to this proposal. Um, uh, I think feeling devastated by the loss, potentially, of three historic row houses on the block. Um, feeling uh, extremely concerned about the loss of eight uh, rent-regulated units uh, that exist in those brownstones. Uh, and also, uh, leaves us, certainly leaves me, asking uh, many uh, important questions about the affordability component of this project. Um, of course, uh, the number of affordable units, but more than just the number, uh, the, the nature and size of those units, and whether they'll be accessible to families in a, in a district with such deep uh, need for affordable units for families with kids. Um, questions about uh, the income targets of those uh, units as well in, in a community which has lower incomes on average than 
the rest of New York City. And of course, we have a number of process concerns as well, um, including the fact that the community board has not had a formal briefing since the scope of the project changed pretty significantly. Uh, so I, I look forward to uh, getting answers to, to some of these questions and to hearing from the public and of course from the applicant. Uh, again, thank you, uh, Chair Moya. I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, the first panel for this item includes Eric Palatnik, uh, Land Use Counsel for the applicant, and Nancy Dunn and Shiva Gomi as lead environmental consultant and lead architect for the project. This applicant team will testify remotely, so I will now ask that they be unmuted. And Council, if you would please administer the affirmation. Panelists. Please raise your right hand and state your name for the record. Eric Palatnik. Nancy Doon. Shiba Gomi. Thank you. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and in answer to all council member questions? Yes, we do. Yes, I do. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, when you're ready to present your slide show for the proposal, please say so and it will be displayed on screen by our staff. Slides will be advanced when you say next. Once again, for the viewing public, anyone wishing to obtain an accessible version of this presentation, please send an email request to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. Now, Mr. Uh, Polotnik, you and uh, your team may begin. Thank you very much, Councilman Moya and members of the committee. And we know everybody's time is extremely valuable, so we'd like to thank you for the, uh, the amount of time you're dedicating to these issues. I'd also like to acknowledge all of your service and to acknowledge the oncoming uh, September 11th tomorrow and uh, to wish us all a lot of strength as we uh, remember our friends and colleagues from those days. Uh, this application, as the councilman uh, just so eloquently called out to all of you, is a rezoning uh, at 633 to 641 West 142nd Street. It's on the corner of Riverside Drive. And uh, it is laden with issues, as he just mentioned a moment ago. And the issues do relate uh, to everything he said, the level of affordability, uh, the units, uh, the size, the family nature of them. And really, most importantly, I think, is the communication with the community board. Uh, and I'd like to uh, call for the slide presentation to be called up, and I'll speak to those issues. Uh, we are here today asking you to rezone a, a block, a portion of a block, uh, on West 142nd Street in Manhattan. Uh, that is a, an outcarving uh, of, and you can leave it right there. That's a great place to leave it on that page. Now, now the second page is great while I'm introducing it. You can see the site right here. Uh, you can see it's within an R6A district, and we're proposing an R8A district. And you can see it's carved out in the mid-block section, the R6A is, of a surrounding R8 district that's all around and on all sides. Our site is underdeveloped. One of the lots is vacant. A couple of the, the row houses have not been in great condition, and uh, some of them were occupied. And uh, what the councilman is speaking to right now is what I'm trying to explain to everybody so you could see as I go to present. Uh, we are committed now and have been to providing as deep a level and as much affordability as we can in family-sized units. When we started with the application, we presented an R9A scenario to the community board. That is what they heard through the ULA process. When we were approved and acted upon by city planning just a week ago, about 10 days ago, they reduced it to an R8A version. We have not had the chance to go back and meet with the community board. So I wanna say from the beginning that we are committed to meeting with the community board, to explaining this R8 scenario that we're explaining to you today to them and spending as much time as is needed to answer any question uh, and try and get to a, a common place. So with that as the backdrop, I'd like now to present the building uh, and present what we're requesting here. As I just mentioned a moment ago, as you can see on both sides of the slide here, uh, it is in an R6A district right now, the property. The left side is the existing conditions. The right side are the proposed conditions. The R6A that's there right now has no affordable housing requirement. The buildings that are there right now could be knocked down and an R6A compliant building could be developed. We're asking to rezone the property with the understanding that if it is to be approved, it'll create 66 units and uh, 17 of those 66 units would be affordable. So we're hoping that the, the, the support 
mechanism for this application is the fact that we are creating affordable units where none exist right now. Uh, and we're going to try and do that to even overcompensate for any of the units that were lost in the existing row houses. Uh, next slide, please. This slide shows you the proposed zoning map in more detail. You can see very clearly that it's in predominantly an R8 area with this mid-block portion of West 142nd uh, rezoned years ago as an R6A, primarily to protect the row house nature of the block. So that is part, I think, of where the rub is with the community, is some of the concern uh, of folks is that it was rezoned specifically. The thrust of our application to you is that we're really asking to rezone the portion of the block that's on Riverside Drive, which I think everybody can, can understand has a history of larger buildings. Um, next slide, please. This shows you the site uh, with a visual on the left of what it is right now. You can see the vacant lot on the corner is, at, is the property that's proposed to be developed upon, as well as the four row houses to its right. Three of the four row houses that you see on the left side of the page are vacant. They were in pretty poor condition. The one that's remaining that's ours, this is the fourth one, that's been fully renovated and is occupied by many and some of the people that were in the buildings that were to its left that are now vacant. The right side of the screen shows you what we are proposing. Again, it's been downsized from what it was shown to the community board. It was shown to the community board as a 14 store, as an 18 story building, excuse me. This, what you see now reflects an R8A, which is a 14 story building. Next slide, please. This is just some of the information that we presented to, to the community board uh, and tried to show that we do meet or are trying to meet the goals of the community. Uh, the community has made commentary in their community needs reports looking to develop soft sites with affordable housing. And we are trying to do that in a way that is contextual uh, to match the what is now the R8 proposal. Uh, next slide, please. This is an interesting slide that goes to the affordability component of the application, which I think is a big part of this application, of course, uh, that the community board nine rent increased by 21%. Uh, over the past few years. It's it's quite a bit larger increase than even Manhattan, uh, which increased by only 5.5%. Uh, we're calling out here, of course, what everybody knows, which is the pressing need for affordability, but even showing you how much more it's needed in this community. Uh, next slide. Now, I'm going to let Nancy speak to this slide for a minute. She's going to give you an overview of how the building height uh, we believe fits within the neighborhood. So Nancy Dune with VHB, if you can speak for a few minutes and just speak to this fact. Are you able to speak? Yes. Great. Sorry. Uh, so good afternoon. I'm Nancy Dune. I'm a planner with VHB. Um, so the image at the top of the slide shows how the building would be consistent with the primarily large scale apartment buildings along Riverside Drive. So directly south of the site is a 140 foot tall building, which will be the exact same height as the proposed building. And then south, moving south along Riverside Drive, the buildings range from 128 to 216 feet. Um, the diagrams in the lower right show that there's a significant grade change along the block. There's a change of 49 feet between Broadway and Riverside. And as a result, as you see on the top image, although the building would be 140 feet in total height, it appears to be only nine feet taller when you're looking down Broadway. And then the image on the lower left um, looks down 142nd Street from Broadway. So you can see directly across from the site is that existing 140 foot tall building along Riverside, and if you look down to the north, you really you, you really can't see that building, which would be the same for, for this building. Uh, next slide. So the map here on the left um, shows how the FAR is consistent with the buildings along Riverside. You can see the proposed building would really mirror the total density directly to the south and to the north. And on the other blocks, this density actually carries deeper east um, into the side streets. And then the map on the right shows how the project is consistent and compatible with the building heights along Riverside. Uh, the map shows there's this built, uh, uh, bulkier outline of building footprints along the south side of 142nd Street. Next slide. Did, 
Did we lose our panelists? There we go. I was, I was a combination of I muted myself and then I was not allowed to unmute myself. Two features my wife would love to have in our home environment. <laughs> uh, so this map shows you what I'm trying to show you, and I started to explain a moment ago and you couldn't hear me, is the left side shows you the number of new developments that have been created in Community Book District 9 since 2014. You can see 18 developments, including 1,600 units nearly. The right side shows you how many have been affordable, only ours. Uh, or at least using MIH, I should say, using inclusionary housing. So it, it's really a dramatic difference that there has been none created. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this slide is just to, meant to, to drive home the point that I was saying before, which is really uh, what we're hoping is the enticement for this application. The left side shows you the current zoning produces zero affordable housing. It's R6A, you can create 32 apartments, none of which would be affordable. What we're asking you for is to go to an R8A. That would let us build 66 apartments, 17 of which are affordable. And I think there's even some talk in the works of how to increase that number and how to make those units more family sized. Uh, that's what the councilman was speaking to earlier. So uh, I hope this is conveying to everybody that we are doing our best to try to provide as much affordable housing as we can. And of course, it's with zero government dollars. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this shows you in, in more specificity because we know this is the conversation. Uh, that's at hand. Uh, the number of units, again, that are being created that would be affordable under the inclusionary housing program. Uh, there are 66 proposed. We're proposed units in total. Uh, we're proposing option one at 25% of the residential floor area right now, which I have a feeling we, we will increase. Uh, and that re results in 17 permanently affordable units mixed between the income spectrum of 40% AMI to 100% AMI. Uh, next slide. Uh, the, on this slide, actually, stay here for a second. What will change, we can tell you in the future, uh, after speaking to the councilman and to other folks, is the size of the apartment and the affordability here. You could see on the right side, this is what the councilman was speaking to, that you see the word studio. Uh, he was not happy with that. Uh, and we will endeavor to change that uh, so that although there may still be a few studios, you will not see what you see now, which is the majority of the units are in fact studios and more bedrooms. Uh, we will endeavor to make them larger family units. Uh, next slide. Here you could see again, just trying to make it very clear so everybody is completely understanding of the affordability matrix and what we're proposing. The left side again shows you uh, the total number of units and the total number that are affordable uh, and the right side, excuse me, the right side shows you the total number that are affordable. And again, you could see at the bottom where it says zero affordable three bedroom and just a few two bedrooms. That's not what the councilman wanted to see and we will endeavor to change that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this next slide and the rest of the slide will be for Shiva, who's the project architect, and I'll let her explain uh, the next few slides. Go on, Shiva. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Eric. Um, thank you very much for your time and the opportunity to present this project. Um, my name is Shiva Gomi. I'm the Director of Planning and Community Development at Offgang Architects. Um, this slide shows that we've been trying to incorporate the design elements and neighborhood characters um, into the facade design for this future development and make it as contextual as possible with a lot of research and study um, that we did. Uh, you can see the proposed material, the colors, the, the frames around the windows, the stone details, um, and all these kind of like in-depth uh, details that we're proposing to resemble the existing historic facade and also providing human scale uh, perspective for the pedestrian to reflect what is going on with the rest of the neighborhood and um, the, the rest of the building facade um, in this community. And we do have a specific emphasis on the entrance um, and I will show you the site plan um, that, that you know, shows where the, where the existing uh, or the proposed entrance is. Next slide, please. The design team and the development team are definitely meeting to, uh, committed to provide sustainability features for this uh, proposed development. Uh, we're looking into providing um, energy saving appliances, the, the um, 
the, the off-gassing VOCs and paints and other materials that we are going to use in the interior to improve the, the indoor air quality. Uh, we're going to have proposed solar panels on the roof, outdoor rec area that I will show you on the, on the floor plans. Uh, where we are uh, committed to provide air sealing and high performing windows um, on the facade, um, along with uh, the low flow plumbing fixtures. Um, I will pass it as the next slide to Nancy again, and I'll jump back to explain some of the renderings for you. Thank you. Great. So um, the rezoning area is located in a national register eligible West Harlem Historic District. It is not a New York City landmarked designated or even eligible district. But when we assessed the conditions uh, of the existing buildings, we found that they really lacked uh, the historic integrity um, for the reasons that I'll go through on this slide. So um, 633 and 635 have been resurfaced with a synthetic stone revere. Um, and that is out of character for the time period and then the other 12 uh, row houses. The curvature of Riverside Drive um, resulted in a non-occupied unusable parcel at the end of the block, which, you, which Eric showed on that existing uh, conditions photo in the very beginning. Two of the buildings, 635 and 633, have a non-raised first floor entry um, because their stoops were actually removed. And as a result, it really sort of visually breaks the rhythm of the 12 other row houses. Um, not surprising, there's various hazardous materials that were used in the construction in the early 20th century of these buildings. Um, and again, due to that uh, late development of Riverside Drive and the curvature of the block, which again, you saw in that existing photo in the beginning, that end row house um, has an undesigned, it actually has a blank uh, Western in interior, uh, exterior wall. And then lastly, to point out, uh, the easternmost row house will be preserved and will remain intact. Uh, next slide. So this slide shows you very, in a linear format, the vacancies of the apartments in the other buildings. I won't spend too much time on this other than to show, try to show you here, if you could see at the bottom of, of each date, did not request renewal and vacated, did not request renewal and vacated or voluntarily relocated. We tried to show you in very clear detail that we did not force anybody out uh, or did not try to force anybody out or did not try to give everybody the impression they were being forced out. Uh, some people left on their own. The people that uh, were, did not want to leave were offered new spaces, uh, primarily in 633, which is the remaining building. Uh, next slide. You see the remaining slides are going to be the building, which we'll show you. And Shiva, you can go through that. And then we're happy to answer any questions uh, after you see the building. Thank you. Sure, sure. I'll quickly go over the, the remaining slides. So um, this is a review from Riverside Drive to show the height of the building. And um, the, the fact that we are what we are doing, the concept behind the design for this building is like a um, traditional mid-block um, concept which is like a, a bunch like a row of townhouses at the end of the block there's going to be like a higher um, um, elevation building and um, this um, new development can you go to the next slide please and this is an emphasize on the on the entrance along riverside drive um, that i mentioned earlier next slide please and this shows the um the proposed development from the uh, 142nd and as you can see, um, we tried to, you know, set down the building, incorporate the dormer design uh, to make sure that we are like slowly stepping down to get to the um, to like the existing context of the of the townhouses. So we're going 14, 12, 10, and then um, the, the like the gradually the, the elevation uh, steps down. Next slide, please. This is a side plan that shows that the. Um, like the existing, uh, I'm sorry, the proposed building. You can see the entrance of the um, of the lobby along Riverside Drive. Next slide, please. This is a schematic height diagram. Shows the maximum height is going to be 140 feet. Next, please. Schematic massing. Next, please. Next couple of slides um, 
showing the schematic uh, floor plans and the unit distribution. Uh, I'm sorry about the colors. I don't know what happened. The color code is uh, missing. But technically, on the left side, you see the ground floor um, schematic design for the lobby. It's going to be a double height lobby with laundry room and bike storage and mechanical units in the back. And then on the second floor, we have um, recreation room that goes on the roof of the um, um, it existing building uh, on the right, and uh, that creates some sort of uh, outdoor rec room as well. Next, please. Um, the unit distribution, again, if you have any specific um, question, I can, I can provide you with more detailed square footage numbers. Next, please. And the higher floors. The next, I think that was the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. We know that uh, people must have a lot of questions and we're sure there's some people signed up to speak. So we're here to speak, answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, I had a couple of questions, but I know that my colleague, uh, Council Member Levine, um, this is a very important project to him, but I just want to go back to one quick thing. Uh, when we were talking about sort of the integrity of the last three row houses that were there, uh, it was a, a very big concern for the community board uh, those row houses were deemed eligible for the National Register and contributed to the historic integrity of the block. Uh, they were also specifically separated out of the down zoning in, in uh, 2012. Uh, I know that you've, you've touched upon that, but I'm, I'm just going back to like, given all of that, how, how are you really justifying demolishing those three row houses there? I'll uh, we can. I'll tell you. Tell you how. We we are no desire to to demolish anything that anybody would consider to be architecturally or historically significant. Uh, Nancy is going to explain to you now that they are not architecturally significant. Uh, and we're also would like to call out to you the fact that the, the block was preserved. Uh, I, I think with the hopes that that the buildings would somehow be improved upon and, and the conditions would, would be better. And, and the, the block does have a special character, but it's these end row houses that we're, we're speaking to. We're not speaking to disrupting the entire block. Uh, Nancy, can you just speak to a little bit more on how we do not meet the state mandate uh, for being uh, a, a landmark building and, and what the distinction is so that they can understand that to the level that you do? Sure, sure, happy to. Um, so just, just to step back again, the district is an eligible district. It's a massive district, um, and they have not individually designated any of the buildings. All of, essentially, all of the buildings in the district are considered contributing, but they are not individually protected. Um, and that's a state, it's a national register. It has nothing to do with New York City landmark protection. And so we went through a process to look at whether we could sort of have an opportunity to, to reuse them. Um, and for those sort of reasons, we went through from a structural standpoint and an environmental standpoint, they couldn't be reused. Um, the buildings, you know, they, they get uh, any building in an eligible district gets sort of flagged for review when it goes through this type of process. Um, but if we had a building permit, you know, if there was no upzoning, you know, anything can happen to those buildings until they're formally designated as New York City landmarks. So because we went through this rezoning process, we went through this extra step of looking at whether we could save the building or use the buildings and they couldn't be reused. All that information has been reviewed by the agencies and they concur um, that they can't be reused. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Let me turn it over to uh, Council Member uh, Levine for questions. Thank, thank you, you, Chair Moya. And I want to pick up on your excellent and important question first. Uh, I've, I've heard your technical explanation, uh, Nancy, on why uh, you don't believe that these three row houses uh, are historically significant. But I want to tell you from the community's perspective, they are absolutely historically significant. These are the kinds of row houses that define the neighborhood, that people feel connected to, that are very much part of the fabric of the neighborhood. So. Uh, technical uh, rationales aside, uh, I think there's almost universal uh, uh, agreement uh, that we don't want to lose those row houses. So my, my question to you is why not develop the unused uh, vacant 
part of the site and renovate the three row houses. Yeah, hi, it's Eric. It's Eric Palatnik. Uh, the, the problem with that, Councilman, is that the, the vacant lot, which I believe you speak to, is lot 14, it's the one from Riverside Drive. Uh, it's a relatively small lot. It, it, it's, it's in and of itself, it's, it's, it's probably half the size of the remaining lots. It's got a curvature to it. Uh, there are all sorts of foundational issues that relate to Riverside Drive, which is why property has not been developed upon through the years. It's a very difficult site to develop on its own. And the investment just simply wouldn't be worth uh, what it would, would it take to uh, make the site suitable. So that that's the reason why. We have looked at ways, we started to get into this discussion with the community board very early, uh, a couple of years ago, about ways to maintain the facades of these buildings or somehow uh, replicate the, the townhome or brown townhome look of, of the block. And Shiva might be able to speak to that. But to save the buildings, the buildings are in, in fairly poor condition. They're, they're laden with asbestos. Uh, they've really been stripped of all of their historical significance. So although I understand what you're saying, they, they have sort of a quaint look to them. It sort of brings you back to, you know, the New York City of, of a yesteryear. And we get that we're asking to that. But the, the argument for that is there's not much there to save. So I don't know if that helps the, the discussion at all for long. Not, 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 not really. Uh, similarly, uh, there are currently eight apartments, understood they're vacant, but they are formally rent regulated units. They are uh, part of the, the precious finite stock we have of rent regulated, I think in that case rent stabilized, units. And am, am I to understand that the state law allows you to demolish rent regulated units and then they're evaporated from the rent regulation rolls? There's that big of a loophole? Well, it's so long as they've been vacated and that everybody is placed, that's that requirement. So that, that's been done. But uh, we, I am aware of a few discussions that, and thoughts that have been going around over the past few days and I think that there is a strong effort on behalf of the applicant to try to recapture uh, those those eight units that you're speaking to were, were smaller units. Uh, they were basically SROs, uh, and and we'd like to be able to look to a way to maybe recapture that uh, within the redesigned building and find some way to provide uh, for that. So that's hopefully we can somehow make right with that issue for you, even though not, we're not legally required to do so. Uh, we would be required to do so under, under, I think, what you're asking us to do. So that's a legal mandate also. So we have two legal requirements, you and, uh, and the rent regulation laws. And I think we'd like to uh, comply with both. I mean, to me, the loss of even one regulated unit is just gr grievous and it should be avoided at all costs. And I, uh, I'm very upset to learn the, what appears to be some, the fact that this would be permitted among, uh, by state housing law. Um, so uh, what happens on this property if your application is not accepted? Well, it's, you know, I hate, I hate to say what we can do uh, because it's not our intention. We desire to do the RA day. Uh, we, what can be done is an R6A development. That's what can be built on the property. That's what's been able to be built uh, throughout the years. Uh, the R6A would result in a 70 a 70 foot tall building it would not be a brownstone building it would not uh it would not have any of the, the affordability that we spoke about but that's what can be built uh but i'm not sitting here telling you that's what we want to build if that was if that was so lucrative uh everybody would have been jumping at the hoops to build to build the r6a because that's the allowable uh really it, it, the, the economic uh smart move here is to do a larger development than an r6a uh, and even with the, the inclusion of the affordability on the developer's back, uh, that still incentivizes them to, to redevelop the property. So uh, we could do an R A, we could do a 70 foot tall building, it would have probably 34 apartments in it, uh, but that's not our intention. And then we're not here telling you that that's what we want to do, but that's what could be done. I mean, it's disappointing and alarming to hear that that is the fallback plan. Uh, I think that's in many ways the, wor the worst of all possible worlds. 
On the income targeting, this is uh, a community that has a lower median and average income than, than much of the city and region. Uh, I understand you have units that go as low as 40% AMI. Uh, another horrible uh, failure we're dealing with is the fact that average median income includes Scarsdale and wealthy suburbs. It doesn't just take into account the income of the immediate neighborhood. Um, someone who makes minimum wage, uh, would, if a single, a single uh, person would make, making 30,000 a year, would be below 40% of AMI. So are they not even allowed to apply for one of those units? You know, that's, that's an, a not a black and white answer explain what I, how I understand it to work. Yes, they would definitely be allowed to apply. The question is, when modeling was done, whether or not the rent burden that they would be suffering would be greater than 30% of their total income. So say somebody who is at a, a, a lower AMI than 40% applied, uh, but yet when they applied their rent burden, it was found that they were spending 50% of their monthly rent, paycheck, on rent. Well, that's not a healthy situation for those people to be in either because we all have to eat and there are other costs. So the answer is, is nothing legally necessarily preventing it. HPD, I understand, likes to have it within a two or three percentage point spread of that 40% AMI though, if only because of what I just mentioned a moment ago for the fear that uh, somebody that might have a lower AMI uh, might end up with a higher rent burden than they should. So uh, that is not our doing, that's a bigger picture than us, uh, but that's the way the rules work. Um, have you talked to HPD about getting HPD financing to expand the, the number and the level and the quality of affordability? We have spoken, uh, I don't know if my consultants, who they've spoken to at HPD, but uh, we work, I work with a bevy of consultants. There is no money at HPD right now. Uh, for any private development right now. The, so, the, you, and then to me, they told you there's no money for any private development? Not to subsidize a private affordable development right now in an MIH. Uh, and to make it worse, they did away, they wiped out last year the AIRS program, which is a, a su successful program. And, uh, and to make it even worse, the 421A program is, uh, is on the cusp also. So, uh, no, there is no money available for a developer to go to to do deeper affordability. And if there is, we would be happy to work with any program in place to do so. We have a large number of people who want to testify from the public, which, which we're all anxious to hear from in person and, and virtually, so I don't want to take up too much more time. Um, but the, the scope of the project changed pretty dramatically. Uh, it had originally been proposed at R9A, it's now being proposed at R8A, and the community board has not had a formal opportunity mm -hmm. to meet with you to discuss this revised scope. Uh, would you agree to do so, to meet with the community board to discuss the revised plan? Yes. Okay, I'm happy to hear that. I'm gonna pause now and pass it back to the chair because we're anxious to hear from members of the public. Uh, uh, thank you again, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, appreciate you giving up your time. Um, there being no further questions, uh, the applicant panel uh, is now excused. Uh, the first uh, public panel on this item uh, will be State Senator Robert Jackson. You may begin. So good afternoon, uh, start my video. Good afternoon, Chair Moyer uh, and members of the Zoning and Franchise Committee. I'm State Senator Robert Jackson and I represent the area in question, uh, West 142nd Street. Um, and I was a city council member before uh, Mark Levine. And I say to you that I oppose this rezoning of West 142nd Street from uh, R6A to R8A, and I oppose the original plan of upzoning to R9A as well when it was presented in April to the community board. And I'm following the lead of our community, so the council should be fully aware of that. And as I heard 
at CB9's Housing, Land Use, and Zoning Committee emergency hearing on this matter, which was held Tuesday evening uh, in a unanimous poll vote of the committee members and board members and members of the public. The West Harlem community is not uh, uh, opposed to the development overall. They are opposed to this development uh, that would destroy the character of a historic block uh, without meaningful addressing the affordability crisis. This rezoning flies in the face of nearly two decades of work by community and community board to plan intentionally uh, in their 207-197A plan that I act actively participated in myself. They stated that the goal is to, quote, ensure the future development is compatible with the existing and historical urban fabric and complement the neighborhood's character. Neither the nine R9A nor the lightly revised R8A building plans are compatible. And let me be clear, this upzoning would also take away affordable units. Uh, in these existing brownstones, brownstone, there were currently 24 rent-stabilized apartments of various sizes to accommodate different family configurations. The proposed uh, from the developer would create only 20 units of so-called affordable that will be most likely will be studios and one bedrooms at a level that doesn't meet the income of our neighbors most at risk in the housing affordability crisis. And as uh, Council Member Mark Levine has stated, he raised some legitimate questions. Uh, can, can this be put on hold and let the developer go and work with the community? Question mark. And if so, then I ask that to be the case. And it appears as though by Mark Levine asking that question himself, he would agree that if possibility, if that can happen, it should happen. So I strongly encourage the subcommittee to listen to the nearly unanimous will of community and reject this application for upzoning of West 142nd Street near Riverside Drive. Thank you, uh, Chair Moya and members of the Zoning and Franchise Committee as a former member of the City Council. Thank you, Senator. Uh, before you go, uh, I just want to turn it over to Council Member Levine who has a uh, question for you. Very quickly, and thank you, Chair, because I am anxious to hear to more members of the public. It's good to see you, Senator, and I agreed with many of the points that you raised. I know you were deeply involved with uh, all the rezonings around, the, around 2012 uh, at a time when the city was aggressively pushing uh, the rezoning in the Manhattanville area and uh, the community had a lot of leverage at that point. Do you know why at that moment when the community had so much leverage, that block wasn't landmarked? Because that really would have offered such strong protection. Well, I, I can't answer that question at this point in time, Mark, as you know, 2012 was 10 years ago and I don't, the details of at that particular time, I'm not fully aware of now, but I say to you that uh, when uh, Borough President Scott Stringer was involved as a Borough President, he, we, he put forward a rezoning in which I supported wholeheartedly uh, in order to, to uh, maintain the integrity of the West Harlem community from 126th Street to 155th Street. And I don't know specifically about that track, whether or not it was excluded, uh, but I do know that uh, during a period of time, uh, some People, and I don't know if it was 142nd Street or another block, they asked for upzoning and I basically recommended uh, a no on that because we didn't meet the needs of our community over there. So needs of our community and understanding that when you look at the census data even now, uh, we have lost uh, members of our community. Uh, my senatorial district, the 31st Senatorial District, which includes West Harlem and goes all the way up to uh, Marble Hill and down to 26th Street and 9th Avenue. Uh, the only senatorial district that has lost uh, uh, members of our community. And why? Because uh, the whole gentrification process has uh, basically hit the community. In fact, uh, Latinx and people of color have decreased where Caucasians and Asians have increased. So this, in my opinion, would increase the gentrification process that we're trying to stop overall and to make sure that people that live in our community will have an opportunity to stay there. And, I, and I, I certainly agree that we've had way too few affordable units created in the neighborhood and way too many affordable units lost. Just just one more very quick question, something alarming that, that I 
uh, heard back from the developer is that uh, the state uh, rent regulation laws, which, which you're obviously more expert on than me, since you all just passed uh, a major uh, modernization and improvement there, that uh, still allow for a developer to demolish vacant regulated units and, and with no legal obligation to replace them? Is that actually what the state rent regulation laws uh, allow, and, and why can't that be fixed? Well, I'd say to you, uh, council member, uh, this is the first time I'm hearing of it. I am not a housing expert. Uh, I'm a legislator overall, and as you know, that probably did not occur uh, during my tenure uh, with my knowledge, because I was never allowed that as an individual uh, state senator. But I say to you that I will be looking into that now that I'm hearing about it, for sure. Good. Thank you, Senator. Back to you, Mr. Chair. Welcome. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you, Senator, for your testimony today. Thank you. Thank you. I'm now going to call up the next panel. Uh, is John Redrick here? Here, John. And he'll be followed by uh, Jack uh, Shorenson. Okay, I can begin. Starting time. I can start. Yeah. Uh, my name is John Reddick. Uh, I'm here to testify in opposition to the proposed project uh, at 629 to 633 West 142nd Street. I speak as a Harlem resident of 142nd Street, living there since 1980, and as an applic uh, participant and partner in the Neighborhood Communities uh, West Harlem Rezoning Initiative, which involved years of effort resulting in our advancing a Community Board 9, Manhattan 9, 197A plan in 2007, which was followed by another five-year review, review by city planning, finally being adopted by uh, the count, city council in 2012. With the approved zoning plan came a concerted effort to carve out R6A zoning districts to serve in support of the community's desire to advance landmark districting and discourage developments of over seven stories in those areas and thus not incentivize developers to pursue projects like the one that's before us today. In support of landmarking goals set forth in the rezoning plan, the community raised funds and advanced application for national register designation, which we expect to finalize and secure in the coming year, while we are also pursuing New York City landmark status as well uh, for the properties cited and a broader district that includes the areas bounded by Riverside Drive and Broadway from 135th to 145th Street. And, and, and a brief response to the uh, electeds talking about why wasn't it landmarked at the time of the zoning. Zoning, uh, landmarking doesn't parallel zoning in terms of time frame. And one of the things that it would be great to see the uh, city council do is make those two calendars run on the same clock. Uh, it's, it is shameful to see city planning ignore their own R6A zoning goals adopted under the West Harlem's rezoning, and even, in, even entertaining this proposal. It also remains- time Expired. I'll give you a little time to wrap it up, if you would. Uh, well, okay. Furthermore, the, the purpose of this development is, is advanced only by the developer's ability uh, to take stabilized tenants and, and move them off the site and to develop a site that would not meet uh, what he's proposing today. Uh, in this effort to grab uh, seven additional stories, he's not even meeting the, what is being lost in terms of affordable housing that he plans to demolish. Thank you. Thank you, John, for your testimony today. Uh, we can now begin with you, Jack. Starting time. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jack Sorensen. Uh, I live in one of the so-called not historically significant brownstones on 142nd Street, and I'm a local law student. So I would just like to rebut some of the uh, blatant lies that applicant counsel stated. Uh, first, I want to make explicitly clear the eight, the, the eight rent-stabilized units are only in the, in the one brownstone that they're going to keep. Before they vacated all of these units, as the state senator mentioned, there were 24 stabilized units 
that while they bought those properties, engaged in a systemic effort to vacate those individuals, including senior citizens of the community who had lived in that building for over 30 years. They refused to allow individuals to make fixes to their apartments. There's some instances of at the community board meeting, uh, the landowner ceased to garbage collection at the places that he made vacant. And in the stoops, it was trash, waist high, until the community said, these places that you abandoned, you're leaving them abandoned. And I want to make explicitly clear that the developer created this situation. The need for afford if he had just maintained the 24 affordable units and not forced them out, there would be no need to now have a lower number of affordable units. And I'd also just like to touch on the, the history of larger buildings. In 2012, as other members of the community mentioned, this was specifically zoned because the rest of Riverside was overdeveloped and destroyed the character of a historic community. And I'd also like to note this lot has been a lot since this area of Harlem was farmland. You can look at the New York City Gov website as someone who has a material history undergraduate degree. And there's, this was a wraparound porch Dutch farmhouse before the turn of the century. So this was not a demolished large building at the turn of the century to build these brownstones. Furthermore, the reason that the applicants council and applicants um, consultants said that these don't have, are not historically significant, one is because the craftsmanship does I'm not inspired. exist anymore to put those buildings back in the condition they were. And furthermore, the city and the developer purposefully neglected this neighborhood throughout the later 20th century and allowed these buildings to become decrepit so that then developers now can come after the community fought for a decade to prevent this. It's gonna get overturned like that if you guys don't do anything. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you, thank you for your testimony today. I'd now like to call up the next panel. Uh, Signe Mortensen, Signe Mortensen, Anita Cheng, Barry Weinberg, Kathleen Collins, Signe Mortensen, do we have Signe? Starting time. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. All righty, thank you. Um, so uh, thank you so much committee for hearing our testimony today. As co-chair for the Land Use and Zoning Committee on CB9, where this project lives, I want to share a little backstory on the two decades long journey that has brought us here today and why the community board and neighbors are so strongly opposed to this R8A rezoning. In the early 2000s, the community board engaged our neighbors to address concerns spurred by the expansion of institutions such as Columbia into the Manhattanville and 125th area above 125th Street. The threat to our affordable housing stock and displacement of residents led to the creation of our 197A plan in 2008, which laid out a roadmap and a vision for our community regarding zoning, land use, and development in our district. In 2012, as a result of that plan, the DCP proposed a zoning text amendment in West Harlem, approved by this city council. So within that rezoning, this very block of roadhouses on 142nd was carved out and downzoned from R8 to R6A to preserve the historic character of the neighborhood and provide consistency with the surrounding buildings on that block. And here we are just nine years later considering a rezoning back to R8A, but the issues that concern our neighbor neighbors are still in place. So in April, we had a hearing on the R9A proposal and everyone on that call unanimously opposed the rezoning. Three days ago, we hosted a public discussion on the altered R8A option, and again, it was unanimously opposed. 
So I want to be clear that the community board has not heard from the developer about altering or addressing our, uh, our concerns since we had that hearing in April. Um, so in conclusion, I do want to ask that you hear the overwhelming voices of our neighbors impacted by this rezoning and vote to not approve this ULERP action. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony today. Um, next, we have Anita Cheng. Starting time. Hello. Hello, all. I am a member of the Housing, Land Use, and Zoning Committee for Community Board 9. What are we discussing today? In fact, there are two big procedures being tested, like levies in the face of a storm, rezoning, and community input in the ULIP process. Will the developers be able to reverse recent rezoning and negate community opposition? I hope not. State Senator Robert Jackson just stated that this upzoning flies in the face of two decades of work. I do encourage everyone to listen to the two public hearings held by CB9 on this development, four and a half hours of community input against. In the April 20th discussion, the developer SOMA's council seemed to acknowledge in response to a question from CB9 member, Ilana Mercado about profit, that in running different zoning exemption scenarios with different numbers of floors, they are discussing margins of profit, not whether or not they will have a profit. So at issue is the pad of their profits versus the community concerns about out of context height, loss of sunshine, lack of affordability, and the loss of our neighborhood character. Why are we even talking about this? Because ULERP has a big weakness. At this point before the council, all the hours of community testimony against the height of this development and the repeated unanimous community board nine votes against this development depend on one person to carry their message to the full council, our local council member. I will see the actual numbers of floors built as a souvenir that council member Levine is leaving his district and a preview of how the probably next Manhattan Borough president will handle developers requesting upzonings. The stakes are not equal. What the neighborhood will lose will be lost forever. I strongly ask the subcommittee on zoning and franchises to vote against the Sony exemption. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Uh, we are now going to call up Barry Weinberg. Good afternoon. Uh, time. To uh, Chair Moya and the council members. I just want to start by putting some context in responding to what's been said today. I am Barry Weinberg, chair of Manhattan Community Board 9, uh, where this proposal is located. We should not be hearing half-baked plans and talks of different unit sizes or numbers of affordable units at this point in the ULER process. The developer has not been in contact with our housing, zoning, and land use committee since May. And I, while and I appreciate Council Member Levine's important and tough questions today, these questions should have been negotiated with the community board prior to the CPC vote, not after while it's in the council. Um, community board nine's full board voted unanimously to oppose this rezoning on May 20th and testified to that effect to the CPC. When the CPC approved the application at an R8A designation, we quickly put together a community discussion of the proposal on the evening of Tuesday, September 8th, where over 60 people attended and there was unanimous opposition. Nothing about the proposal merits undoing the years of hard work that Community Board 9, then Councilmember Jackson, then Borough President Scott Stringer, and the Department of City Planning undertook to rezone this block as R6A in 2012. All of the lots in question were acquired after our rezoning took place. So there is no hardship here that would merit an upzoning of lots that were downzoned less than a decade ago. The developer spent $5.5 million over five years acquiring these five lots to form an assemblage. The affordable housing created in the project is barely more and perhaps less than the existing affordable units that have been lost or would be lost by tearing down the existing buildings. Manhattan Community Board 9 continues to oppose the rezoning of these lots and its executive committee voted on behalf of the full board last night to reaffirm that. We hope the council will also decline to approve this rezoning. This rezoning and this project would actually raise the average rent in our district further. Elevations shown today also showed the block south but both of the blocks to the north of here have six-story buildings along Riverside Drive that may I'm expired. Thank you. If I can just finish. Yeah, you can. MIH may not have been used in our district, but hundreds of affordable units have been created at other projects like the Enclave at 114th and the renovations of PS 186. 
And I want to just note that these buildings have an unbroken row of cornices across 142nd Street as townhouses, which is very rare historically. And we would not be having discussions about tearing down these buildings that would contribute to the West Harlem Historic District expansion proposal pending before the LTC if this were a wider, wealthier neighborhood in another part of Manhattan. To ignore the historic merit of our history. Thank you, Barry. Thank you for your testimony today. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Kathleen Collins. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Kathleen Collins, and I'm a person with a disability. I'm here on the zoning for accessibility matter, as opposed to what's before the board right now, I mean, the committee right now. Okay, hold on one second, Kathleen. We'll get it fixed. Hold on. I'm going to have to leave in like five minutes because I'm doing a presentation on voting with people with disabilities, so maybe that's why they put me up at this moment. No, Kathleen, that's coming up next, so. I understand, but will that continue at past 2.30 because we're not I sure. We have, uh, we have a lot of people that are signed up uh, and we're dealing with this issue. Will I be able to get back issue. on at that time? You, at 2.30? You, you, can, you can try to get back on, but you can always submit your testimony as well. We did so, submit our testimony. Okay. And I just want to, one note I just want to make is that we haven't been given transparency with the zoning. I, I know, Kathleen, I'm sorry, but I have to stick with the uh, okay. item that we have right gotcha. at the current moment. Right. Thank you. And we'll, we'll, right. we'll get back. Sorry well, for the you. confusion there. Okay. Thank you, Councilwoman Rivera, for her help. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Kathleen. I'm, I'm so sorry about that. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, this panel is now excused. Uh, I would like to call up the next panel. Uh, Michael Henry Adams. Elizabeth uh, Witex. Meryl Felix. Kevin Jarvis, Uh, while we wait, I'm going to take this opportunity as a reminder, written testimony may be sent by email to uh, landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. Uh, again, written testimony may be uh, sent by email to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. And do we have Michael Henry Adams ready? Hello? Hey, Michael, one second. Sergeant Martinez, are we ready? Time starts now. Okay, great. Thank you, sir. Um, good morning, or rather good afternoon. Uh, I um, am a resident of Harlem for the past 35 years. I wrote the book, Harlem Lost and Found, an Architectural and Social History, 1765 to 1915. And that really came out of working with Carolyn Kent, um, the founder of the Landmarks Committee of Community Board 9, on an exhibition um, that was sponsored by Borough President Ruth, um, um, the Manhattan Borough President, um, called Heritage on the Heights. That happened in 1992. That was in preparation for the 197A plan of the Community Board. And uh, after the support of Ruth Messenger and getting the 197A plan to include um, uh, elements that would preserve and protect the heritage of our diverse community, we then moved on and in 2012, we got the zoning change on this particular street with the help of the Landmarks Commission and the City Planning Commission. And now all that is to be overlooked and swept aside and um, units of affordable housing that are rent stabilized swept away 
for fewer units of so-called affordable housing, which is not as affordable as the housing that is going to be destroyed. As to the architect of the developer, I must say that our interaction with the State Historic Preservation Office, the Landmarks Commission, and the Planning Commission are such that we have understood from them that these buildings in question are worthy of being city landmarks as part of an historic district, and that it is not true that they are not contributing buildings in an historic district. Moreover, were those buildings to be redeveloped because they're part of a National Register historic district, they would be eligible for the investment tax credit, the federal investment tax credit, and the state investment tax credit um, for historic properties. So this is really an ill-conceived project, and we are adamantly opposed to it. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony today. Uh, next, we have uh, Elizabeth uh, White Whitex. Time starts now. Thanks so much. Uh, my name is Liz Waitakis, and I've been a resident of West Harlem for 18 years. I'm a member of Manhattan Community Board 9, and I am also a historic preservation professional. I was also a resident of one of the row houses on this block, and I lived in a beautiful, affordable, floor-through apartment that had a full gut renovation in 2012. I was also pushed out along with my neighbors in 2017. As a former resident of this block, I'm strongly opposed to this development because the project is out of scale with the historic row house block that has a high level of charm and community and is distinct from the high rise blocks to the north and to the south. This block is unique due to the balance of row houses and apartment buildings, excuse me, renters and owners, the abundance of light, and it is a direct uh, connection to Riverside Drive. Every row house on this block has been restored over the last 10 years, except for the parcels owned by this developer, and I watched them being restored. I'm opposed to this proposal because our community signed an agreement with the Department of City Planning in 2012 to downzone this block from R8 to R6A. I participated in those lengthy negotiations, and I find it extremely frustrating for city planning to renege on that agreement. The buildings on this block are some of the oldest buildings in our neighborhood and they retain a high degree of historic integrity, which is why they were downzoned. The row is eligible for the National Register of Historic Places, and the application to the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission is pending determination. So they're still eligible, and they haven't decided. As a CB9 Manhattan um, has already stated in our official response to the Euler process, this project will add nothing to our community that we want or need. We will lose precious rent stabilized apartments and this pro proposal is creating a loss of current affordability in the units. If anything, the new development will continue to push out longstanding residents and increase the threshold of apartment prices in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Next we have uh, Merrill Felix. Time starts now. Yes. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Marielle Felix. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the proposal of the rezoning um, of the uh, uh, townhouses uh, uh, on 142nd Street. I'd like to speak on behalf of many people in the community. As other members have said, I have been a member of the community um, not 18 years, not 20 years. I've, I'm, I'm a person in her mid-50s, and I have lived there all my life. And I know the character of the um, neighborhood, and I know what uh, changes have come about with other buildings and areas that have been torn down and um, new buildings put up in its place. The um, displacement of many of my neighbors, of uh, the, the flavor of the community has taken place because of this. Um, I'm also very outraged because um, the builders have not reached out to the community uh, sincerely to hear from us, um, to make these proposals, to get our input in order to, um, uh, you know, make sure that we have a say in what is coming along. Um, I, I oppose it to, because of the pedestrian traffic that is going to increase, the vehicular um, traffic that will increase, um, 
what it'll do to the um, one of the few areas of Manhattan that we have where we can actually go sit at a park and enjoy greeneries, the, the trees, um, the fresh air, um, sunlight, um, uh, shading of trees rather than buildings. Um, all of these things need to be taken into consideration before we change the character and the nature of what is be trying to be preserved um, and, or what is existing there already. Um, by putting in a new building, regardless of um, the size of it, whether it's 14 stories, seven stories, um, the units of affordability, that of course plays a factor into it. Me, me being as one person who lives in, um, you know, a, 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 an apartment that is still remains a, affordable to me, um, I would like to keep that in mind, but keep in mind the character of the community and the area that we're living in. Thank you for your time and allowing me to speak on behalf of uh, many in my community. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Uh, next, we have uh, Kevin Jarvis. Time starts now. Hi. <clears throat> I'm deeply opposed to this project of being built. Uh, because I've been in the community for a good 20, 22 years. And I, the biggest thing I flaw I see is the affordability issue. It's just going to be another big apartment that uh, only has 17, right now, 17 affordable units, while the other 66 units are uh, going to be market rate. And since I've been inside this neighborhood, it has changed dramatically. I mean, dramatically to the point where the original uh, community has been pushed out and a new community is coming in that has a lot more money and can spend and other people who are still living community can st and who can still survive in it are trying to keep their heads above water. And it seems as if the developer is just trying to make a quick buck, be devious, uh, make the money and then run and then care about whatever problems happen and let the community deal with it. And we have enough problems as it is right now. Uh, one is just this justice developer. Other is, is, you know, trying to get people jobs and it go, the list goes on. And the city has never been behind us. As a, one law uh, student said, the city has been never put money into this side of town before until it can find a quick buck right and that is right now so i'm against this project and i would do anything i can to fight it thank you thank you thank you so much for your testimony today uh this panel is now excused i'd like to bring up the next panel uh margaret seeley uh athena lamacus gabe morales and walter alexander Time starts now. Hold on, Margaret, you're still you. muted. Hi, I'm Margaret Seeley. I am a longtime resident of 635 Riverside Drive, which is a building a block away from the site that we're talking about. Um, and uh, I'd like to say that in terms of the character of this neighborhood of West Harlem, the buildings are important. And even more than the buildings, the people are important. And the people that give this neighborhood the character that they have, that it has, many of them are people who would not be able to live in this proposed building. So I'm opposed. Um, to the building itself and to changing the um, category from 6A to 8A. I also wanna say that it's disingenuous of the developer to say that their building is appropriate for the neighborhood because it's consistent with the size of buildings that are along Riverside Drive. And because I live on Riverside Drive, I know that it's, it's precisely that reason that the, the buildings around it are so tall, 
that this block, the way it is now, is so important. And the other thing I want to mention is that the undeveloped part of this property is not just a pile of rubble. It's beautiful, um, green, well um, cared for, not by the developer. I don't know who cares for it, but it's full of green plants and sun and shade. And it's, I learned for the first time just now that it's part of original farmland. So I want you all to be able to picture that when you're deciding how to um, proceed with this proposal. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, Athena Lamakis. Time starts now. Hi. Um, I'm just going to read. Thank you so much for letting me speak. Um, my name is Athena Lamakis, and I would like to say I'm opposed to the Yearlap rezoning application from R6A to R8A by SOMA developers and an, an increase of seven to 14 stories at 633-641 West 142nd Street. I am a New Yorker and I've lived in Harlem for over 20 years. I love to walk along Riverside Drive and I'm very angry and devastated that there are plans to build a 14 story building along Riverside Drive. So I'm getting upset. Not only will this building be a major eyesore to the architectural integrity of the area, but it will block light to the park and the area. We live in a city where the sense of space and openness is in constant threat. I am also, also saddened to hear that the brownstones are being torn down and my neighbors displaced. My understanding of the history of the zoning of the area that this was rezoned to save brownstones or at least from building tall buildings. By rezoning this area, it is, letting, it is setting a dangerous precedent for the future developers that zoning doesn't matter. In addition, this building will not add any additional affording housing to the neighborhood. The brownstones they plan to dear, tear, whatever, I'm not gonna say that. Um, we will be losing uh, affordable housing in the neighborhood. I'm very upset that this building will destroy the beautiful area along Riverside Drive. It does not fit with the other architecture in the area. Thank you. The next speaker will be Gabe Morales. Time starts now. Hello, members. Um, I uh, am a resident of Harlem. I've lived in Harlem for about 20 something years. I just recently uh, joined the community board. I was just recently appointed to the community board. And yesterday I took a walk to 142nd Street to take a look at what was going on. And I am strongly opposed to this rezoning. Uh, I wrote a bunch of stuff down, but I'm just strongly opposed to this rezoning based off of uh, someone's desire to make this a lucrative uh, endeavor while taking away the fabric and the character of this neighborhood. <clears throat> when you walk down the hill of 142nd Street, there's just something about the hills in Harlem that don't really exist anywhere else. And so these homes have a very, very specific character. And if you're going to put a 14 story building, it just doesn't really make any sense outside of it being lucrative because there's nothing that's been done to uh, in incorporate the community. I spoke to one of the uh, uh, people who owns their home still there. And apparently the developers have not really been uh, engaging with the community. So I really don't believe anything that they're saying. And uh, to get rid of the character in exchange for 14 stories and a rezoning, uh, I'm just strongly opposed to it. And everyone has pretty much said what I'm saying. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you again for your testimony today. Uh, our next panelist is Walter Alexander. Time starts now. Hello, am I uh, on camera? Can you hear me? Yes. You can't hear me. Okay. 
I'm Walter Alexander. I'm also on the community board nine. Uh, I sent in a letter yesterday with my disapproval of this uh, some rezoning. I've been a long time resident of Harlem. I've been in my building here since 1978. Um, there's a character and a flavor in Harlem, especially with our, our Riverside Drive that really needs to be maintained. Uh, the folks that live there, as they've been displaced, it's, it's, it's tragic. And for a developer to come in and for the city planning to usurp the process of going through the community board to listen to the concerns of the neighborhood and to go ahead with uh, their plans to make changes to something that they've already started to say that they would keep is a disservice to the community and a disservice to the community board and to the neighborhood of Harlem in, in, in general. I disapprove of this zoning change and uh, I'll just stay on that online to listen to what everyone else is saying. But I strongly oppose this zoning change. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony uh, today. Uh, we will now um, move to close. Uh, if there are any remaining members of the public who wish to testify on the 629-639 West 142nd Street rezoning proposal, please press the raise hand button now. Or for those in the chamber, please see the sergeant uh, now to prepare a speaker card and the meeting will briefly stand at ease. There being no members of the public who wish to testify, uh, before we close out, I'd like to turn it over to Council Member uh, Levine for some uh, closing remarks. Um, thank you, Chair Moya, for uh, doing a great job chairing this hearing. And, and, and most of all, thank you to every member of the public who took time to speak out now. I just so appreciated the perspectives and the passion and, and agreed with the great majority of the comments that were made. And it's just, it's just an outrage that because this block was never landmarked, because our, our, um, our state laws on regulated units allow them to demolish these brownstones uh, is, is, is just horrific. And I grieve this loss. Um, the fact that it appears those brownstones will be demolished no matter what we decide here on the rezoning is deeply, deeply upsetting. And so now we, we, we have to find a way to do the right thing for the community. Uh, and I've put some of my principles on the table in terms of uh, his, uh, the affordability of this project, which I consider to be currently inadequate. Uh, but these comments today have really been important contributions to this debate. Um, and so uh, again, I thank everyone who spoke out today and thank you, Mr. Chair. Back thank, to you. thank you, Council Member. Uh, there being no members of the public who wish to testify on uh, the LU numbers 836 and 837 for the 629-639 West 142nd Street rezoning proposal, the public hearing on these items is now closed and they are laid over. Uh, I now open the public hearing on LU numbers 832 and 833 for the 2840 Knapp Street rezoning proposal seeking a zoning map amendment and related zoning text amendment and relating to property in Council District 48 in Brooklyn. Once again, for anyone following online and wishing to testify remotely today on this item, you must register in advance online and you may do that uh, now by visiting the Council's website at council.nyc.gov uh, forward slash land use. If you are here today in person and wish to testify, please remember to see the Sergeant at Arms to fill out and submit a speaker card. The first panel on this item includes Eric Polotnik, uh, Land Use Counsel for the applicant. Mr. Polotnik uh, will again testify remotely, so I will now ask that he be unmuted and I will uh, remind Mr. Uh, Polotnik that uh, you remain under oath. 
Uh, when you are ready to present your slideshow for the proposal, please say so, and it will be displayed on the screen by our staff. Uh, slides will be advanced when you say next. Once again, for the viewing public, anyone wishing to obtain an accessible version of this presentation, please send an email request to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Uh, and now, Mr. Polotnik, uh, you may begin. Thank you very much, Councilman Moya. And, uh I assume my swearing in from before will, uh, will apply now. Uh, if you may please bring up the slides. So I'm happy to be here today on a less controversial rezoning application that was well supported at the community board level uh, by the former councilman and, and is in Chaim Deutsch's uh, former district, as well as uh, by community board 15 and the borough president. Uh, the site at issue, uh, the block that you're looking at, is zoned R5. You're in Sheepshead Bay, just off of the Belt Parkway. Uh, and we are asking to rezone this portion of this block to an R6. If the rezoning were to be approved, it would allow for the alteration of the interior of the building for floor area that's at the ground level that doesn't count as floor area right now because it's storage to allow it to be used to for uh I'm forgetting the term when people come and have their, I can't believe I'm blanking out of this, to come and have their blood uh, removed when they have to have dialysis done. I apologize. Uh, so it's going to be an in, in-building dialysis treatment center. Right now, all the residents of the nursing home go out for dialysis treatment. So by converting the ground floor that's currently storage into a dialysis center, we're creating floor area and we exceed the existing allowable floor area. So the R6 will allow us to make that change. It will also allow us to include 20 parking spaces at the ground floor. Next slide, please. This slide tells you exactly what I just told you a minute ago and explains to you uh, what we're doing. The right side explains to you what I was mentioning a moment ago and I, I blanked out on the term dialysis, but it's a 4,940 square foot dialysis center in the cellar which is what we're seeking to create. And by doing that, we exceed the R5 because the building is already non-compliant. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. You've already seen a picture. This gives you an idea. As you can see, the block that the building is located on is improved upon with just two properties, the seven-story residential building to its south and the six-story nursing home. Next slide. Show you some pictures of the building. Uh, the most important picture here is being pictures one and three uh, picture one at the top shows you the area that is going that is currently now storage you can see a garage entrance there that area of the building is going to be the portion that is going to be converted into a dialysis center view two also shows you some cars on the sidewalk as you explained a moment ago part of the redevelopment project for this building will be to create 20 parking spaces inside the building so that condition will no longer occur next slide please you can see the nursing home now from just all different angles we'll go around it it's a 200 bed nursing home and uh, of course they were very helpful during covid and did whatever they could to uh, accommodate uh, whoever they could with whatever health concerns they had next slide please and we'll just take you around the building. If you can just go ahead now, you can go right to the uh, zoning change map, please, which is a few slides ahead. Next slide, please. This slide shows you the zoning change map. You can see on the left side, the block is an R5. On the right side, it shows you the R6. And the next slide shows you the plans. Next slide. One more slide. Okay, so this slide shows you what we are asking you to do. The area that's, this is the ground floor or uh, cellar level, it should be, that does not count as floor area unless it's utilized. Uh, the area that's in yellow at the top of the page is the proposed dialysis location. Uh, you can see that in yellow. And then to the left side is the parking for 20 cars that we're asking. Those are the only changes to the building that we are requesting and which the rezoning will facilitate. Uh, the remainder of the plans are just the remainder of the building which I'd be happy to click through, but it's it's pretty much just what you would expect. If you can click right to the end, you can see uh, um, an, an elevation of the building. Uh, like I said, this is a very well-supported application. This concludes our presentation. Uh, the rezoning will not create anything new. It will simply allow for the change within the existing building to allow for medical, better medical care for the residents. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, just one quick question on this. 
Uh, do you have a local hiring plan? And if so, could you please describe it? Uh, the, well, the local hiring plan is it's nothing changing. The people that are employed there are still going to be employed there. Most of the staff is local. Uh, everybody that works there, a lot of the staff that works there, lives within 10 miles of the facility. Uh, not Nobody really commutes too far to get there. Uh, there are not going to be too many more jobs created out of this. That's going to be the same nursing staff and the same uh, support staff that exists now that's going to help out uh, with the dialysis when it goes into place. So um, um, it's not going to be much more of a job created than it already is, but it already is. Uh, I can't give you the exact numbers, but uh, there's certainly uh, quite a few people working there right now for a 200-bed facility. Okay, thank you. Um, there being no further questions, uh, the applicant panel uh, is excused. Thank you. Uh, thank you. If there are any remaining members of the public who wish to testify uh, on the 2840 Knapp Street rezoning proposal, please press the raise hand button uh, now, or for those here in the chamber, please see the sergeants now to prepare a speaker card, uh, and the meeting will briefly stand at ease. There being no other members of the public who wish to testify on LUs 832 and 833 for the 2840 Knapp Street rezoning proposal, the public hearing on these items is now closed and they are laid over. I now open the public hearing on LU number 838 for the proposed rezoning text amendment known as the Zoning for Accessibility or ZFA. Once again, for anyone following online and wishing to testify remotely today on this item, you must register in advance and you may do that now by visiting the council's website. If you are here today in person and wish to testify, please remember to see the Sergeant at Arms to fill out and submit a speaker card. Uh, the first panel on this item includes Angela uh, Beliso and Christopher Lee on behalf of the Department of City Planning. Uh, they will be supported uh, for Q&A by Chris Hayner and DEP of the DEP, uh, Robert Pele and Monsoon Park from the MTA, Rachel Cohen from New York City Transit, Victor Khaleesi, the Commissioner of the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities. This panel will testify remotely, so I will now ask that they be unmuted and counsel if you would please administer the affirmation. Applicants, please raise your right hand and state your name for the record. Chris Hayner. Angela Blissio. Robert Paley. In some park. Rachel Cohen. We have Commissioner Khaleesi here. Do okay. we have the Commissioner? All right. Uh, panelists, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth uh, in your testimony before the subcommittee and in an answer to all council member questions? I do. I do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, when you're ready to present your slideshow for the proposal, please say so, and it will be displayed on the screen by our staff. Slides will be advanced when you say next. Once again, for the viewing public, anyone wishing to obtain an accessible version of this presentation, please send an email request to landusetestimony at council.nyc.gov. Uh, and now, Ms. Uh, Belicio and Mr. Lee, uh, you may begin. Um. Great, um, well, we're ready to show the presentation then, please. Um, um, can you go back to, to thank you. Um, good afternoon, uh, Chair Moya and committee members. My name is Angela Blissio. I'm here with Christopher Lee, um, and we are both here from the Department of City Planning. Uh, the MTA and the Department of City Planning, along with the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities, are proposing Elevate Transit Zoning for Accessibility, or ZFA, a citywide zoning text amendment designed to better coordinate private development and station accessibility improvements. Um, next slide, please. Today, only about 30% of stations in the MTA system are ADA accessible. The MTA implements station accessibility improvements, including elevator construction, through its five-year capital programs. 
and the current 20 to 24 capital program dedicates over $5 billion to making 77 subway, Metro North, and Long Island Railroad stations successful. Next slide, please. But elevator construction in subway stations is particularly challenging. Stations are old and can have complex infrastructure. Platforms can be narrow. Existing buildings near stations can limit places for elevators to be placed. Moreover, subsurface conditions present decades worth of highly complex utility infrastructure, including sewers, water pipes, and electrical cables. Because of these unique challenges, often the preferable and sometimes the only solution is to place an elevator and corresponding circulation elements within private property. Transit-related zoning provisions are in place today to help alleviate some of these burdens. These provisions include easement requirements and a transit bonus program. However, they have limited coverage throughout the city. Next slide, please. Zoning for accessibility seeks to support the long-term planning needs of transit stations, to support the long-term planning needs of transit stations and to facilitate station upgrades by expanding and improving transit-related zoning tools. It proposes to expand easement requirements system-wide from limited areas in the city to most station adjacent sites and provide zoning flexibility on sites where easements are provided to offset potential burdens of this requirement on development feasibility and to increase participation in the transit bonus program by increasing its area of applicability from only the highest density commercial districts to other high density areas in the city. Next slide, please. The first component of this proposal is a system-wide easement requirement. As part of this requirement, all developments and enlargements on zoning lots within 50 feet of a transit station and in most zoning districts would need to consult with the MTA to determine whether an easement on a zoning lot is needed to help facilitate station access improvements in the future. Uh, next slide, please. In order to facilitate easements on development sites, targeted relief from certain zoning limits will be provided to minimize potential challenges for, for, for providing an easement. Such zoning relief would include floor area and open space relief to ensure the, that the accommodation of an easement does not reduce development potential, height and setback modifications to facilitate the accommodation of all permitted floor area on a given site, parking relief, to address the potential limitations created by an easement in providing required parking spaces, use allowances to support compatible uses around station entrances, and finally, streetscape relief to ensure that rules pertaining to the ground floor or other elements affecting street design do not conflict with station design requirements. Next slide, please. The second component of the proposal is an expanded transit bonus program that would grant a floor area bonus of up to 20% for a significant station improvement. Today, the current subway bonus special permit only applies to station adjacent sites in the highest density commercial districts in the city. To address the limitations of today's subway bonus mechanism, the proposed transit bonus would expand the geography of areas where a transit bonus may be used to other high density areas and simplify the discretionary review and approval process to an authorization by the City Planning Commission. Next slide, please. The new bonus program would expand this applicability to other high density areas, including all R9 and R10 districts in the city, their commercial equivalent, and M16 districts. In addition, it would also allow sites that are within 500 feet or 1,500 feet of a station to participate in the program in exchange for an off-site improvement that could be constructed at a station that is not immediately adjacent to the site. This feature of the new bonus program to allow both on-site and off-site improvements would encourage a greater number of developments to provide station improvements. Next slide. And finally, the text amendment is also proposing additional discretionary actions that would allow for further zoning modifications, including an authorization that would permit a height increase of up to 25% and a special permit for anything beyond that. Next slide. On April 5th, this proposal was referred out to all 59 community boards, borough presidents and borough boards, 48 community boards submitted recommendations regarding the proposal and 35 of those recommendations were in favor. Three borough boards and three borough presidents submitted resolutions in favor of the proposal, while one borough president submitted a disapproval. The commission held a public hearing on June 23rd and approved the text on September 1st with a few modifications based on feedback received during public review. 
Modifications on the easement provisions include clarification on the applicability of this requirement and exemptions for sites with active applications, adjustments that would streamline the application process and make the review timeline more predictable, and modifications to certain requirements that would have otherwise been too restrictive for locating and utilizing an easement volume. These modifications are generally meant to en enable the timely processing of applications under the proposal in a manner that would maintain the integrity of the easement review process uh, without significantly or unnecessarily delaying development. Next slide. The commission also made modifications to the expanded bonus program. Hudson Yard Station was removed from the bonus coverage as it was recently constructed partially through a separate zoning framework. And the modified text now clarifies that accessibility or capacity enhancing improvements are required for any bonus application. It also makes clear that accessibility improvements are prioritized if a station is not currently accessible. And finally, under the special permit for additional zoning relief, the commission modified the text to clarify that any zoning modifications granted through this mechanism would have to be necessary and needed to facilitate an easement, transit access, or additional floor area on a bonus site. In summary, a zoning for accessibility will improve and expand existing zoning tools to support our collective goal of making all transit stations in the system accessible. This concludes our presentation and we are happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Great, thank, thank you so much. <clears throat> uh, if, just a couple of quick questions here uh, before we go to uh, the public. If the MTA determines that an easement is necessary and acquires one, of, uh, one on a site, how long would it likely take for the MTA to utilize the easement and, the const and construct a station improvement? Um, well, I'll, I'll take that question. Okay. Uh, so there are numerous variables that impact the timing of when an elevator may be built in an easement. Uh, current accessible stations, um, as, as many of us know, are not distributed evenly throughout the city. And our current capital uh, Not right plan, now, but uh, yeah, if you could leave it in the bag, that would be great. Thank you. Our current capital plan, uh, we're is focused on achieving the goal that no customer will be more than two stations away from an accessible station. Uh, we also look to factors such as ridership, demographics, geography, nearby acti activity centers, transfer opportunities, and cost constrictability to decide which stations to prioritize for accessibility. So if we get an easement at a station that meet these criteria, then having an easement at a particular station would be considered as part of the cost constrictability criteria. Um, and regardless of when a station is scheduled for an MTA capital project, the easement will be critical in making that project delivery easier and more timely. Uh, so is construction likely to occur concurrently with the construction of the development or will it happen years later? It, it would happen later. How many years later? As I said, it, it would it would be one of the criteria in considering the cost and constructability, um, and when we uh, identify which stations should be um, should should get accessibility improvements. So, how long does it take you to make that assessment? I'll defer to my colleague uh, Rachel Cohen from the the system-wide accessibility group. Or can can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes, great. So this is Rachel Cohen from System-wide Accessibility. So you know, our, our capital planning process is in five-year cycles, right? And as we plan ahead for each subsequent five-year cycle, cost and constructability, as Moonsen said, is one of the criteria that we consider um, when selecting stations to prioritize for accessibility upgrades. So in the future, if we have an easement at a station, that would be one of the criteria that we would consider. Um, but you know, this would be something that happens as part of the MTA's existing five-year capital planning cycle. 
um, you know, which falls under a number of, of other, uh, you know, legal and regulatory parameters that are outside of this zoning proposal. So are you saying every five years there'll be the ability to evaluate whether or not you're able to uh, construct the easement on that site? Oh, you, we, did we mute Rachel? If, if we can unmute Rachel. Get there we go. Yep. So, um, so yes, our, our capital plan is on a, a five-year planning cycle. So we have already named the stations that we intend to prioritize in, in this capital plan, which is underway. Um, and then, you know, as we go forward to the 2025 to 2029 plan, we would be doing our next round of uh, prioritization and selection. So you select them, right? And then from there, how long is that process after it's been selected? Again, it really depends on the project. So we have a number of projects in our current capital plan that are already underway that have been awarded to contractors. Um, and we have a number that are in the pipeline. Um, so it would so be project out of project, the ones that you have already, out of the ones that you've done already, what has been the average timeline uh, to get one of them completed? What has been sort of the shortest one and what has been the longest one that you have in the pipeline now? Sure, so we have you know, a, a limited number of easements now and, and this proposal is hoping to expand that. Um, I don't have on hand details about specific easements. I, I don't know if my, if my colleagues could comment on that. If, if not, we can certainly follow up on that. Uh, just, just to say that, um, you know, in the meantime, regardless of the length of time, the easement is not vacant space, right? Zoning for accessibility provides that that space is, is usable space for the developer. Um, so, you know, the the intent and the design of the program is is such that that you know potential time lag is is accounted for in that way. Um, the developer is able to use the space. And and I see um, one person raising their hand. I'm not sure to to add or to get unmuted. I was asking to be unmuted, and now I am. I, I will just add that the timing of the easements is um, at the um, circumstance of development and is not, you know, coincidental with our programming, you know, our capital plan needs. So um, there, there will certainly be disconnect between when we receive um, a, an easement and when we're able to use that easement actually in a capital construction project. Okay, thank you. Uh, Moving on, uh, was there any consideration for expanding the bonus to apply to medium density districts or uh, a wider geographic applicability? I, I can take that answer uh, question. Thank you for uh, the question. Um, so through Zoning for Accessibility, we're actually expanding the existing subway bonus quite substantially. Uh, today under the zone, zone under the subway bonus mechanism, we have an adjacency requirement that limits the applicability to sites that are just next to stations. Um, it also only applies to the highest commercial districts in the city. Uh, what we're doing through zoning for accessibility is we're expanding the applicability to all R9 and R10 density level districts, and we're eliminating this adjacency requirement so that sites that are within 500 feet or 1,500 feet can uh, provide an improvement and, and, and participate in the program. We believe that R9 and R10 density level uh, uh, districts are, are the most appropriate for um, for this bonus program simply because on a typical zoning lot uh, in, in these density uh, in these densities you're able to generate based on the analysis that we can that we conducted you're able to generate enough of a floor area bonus to cover the cost of a substantial transit improvement um, if we wanted to make the bonus work in the med density level uh, districts, we would have to increase that floor area bonus beyond a 20% floor area bonus, which is inconsistent with our citywide approach for floor area bonuses. Um, that said, zoning for accessibility is really not meant to replace uh, MTA's responsibilities and, and MTA's cap future capital programs either. Um, it, it's really meant to be additive and, and to help um, support um, capital improvements across the city. I just want to note that the easement provision as well would apply to most stations and, and we feel that that is a very impactful uh, a part of zone for accessibility in allowing the MTA to more easily locate uh, elevators. Thank you. Uh, my next question is the proposed uh, transit improvement bonus program. 
relies on the value that's generated by a 20% bonus to closely match the cost of the station improvement. Uh, has the MTA considered how to facilitate projects where the value generated by the bonus may fall short of a major improvement, like for example, an elevator? Uh, in other words, what happens in scenarios where the value from a bonus is 15 million while the cost of the accessible, accessibility improvements like an elevator cost uh, 20 million? Uh, could it be possible for multiple sites to be pooled together? I can, um, I can answer the first part of this question. Uh, some people mm -hmm. from MTA, if you would like to chime in, feel free to do so. Um, again, the, the bonus program is designed in a way uh, to ensure uh, the timely delivery and completion of improvements. Um, concurrently with each application that are coming in. So as, uh, as a requirement, improvements must be substantially completed uh, before the portion of the development that is utilizing the floor area bonus could be occupied at all. So uh, a, funding, uh, a funding mechanism or a mechanism that would allow for multiple uh, uh, applicants to uh, contribute to a single improvement could potentially result in delays simply because we don't know how many applications will come in um, and, and within a specific time frame, in order to complete or, or to, to pull in enough resources for that improvements to, to, to be delivered in the first place. That creates a lot of uncertainty and unpredictability in terms of the scope and the timing of, of improvements. And we were just, it, it would pretty much go against uh, the, the requirements that we have in today's bonus program. But that said, you know, MTAs. Uh, MTA and the Department of City Planning will continue to work with uh, each applicant uh, to ensure that the proposed improvements would be commensurate uh, with the floor area bonuses that are being granted. Yeah, I would just like to add that the, the circumstance that you posited is, is probably going to be a very, very unusual circumstance. The intention is that a single project would deliver a single improvement. Um, and that the real intent is to accelerate and facilitate MTA's capital program um, investments. And so the combination of the easement provision and the bonus provision are intended to do that. And um, I think to, to uh, you know, to um, think about the different possibilities is certainly, um, you know, an interesting speculation and there could be a situation like that. But I think the more common uh, a situation would be a single developer providing a single improvement. Okay, thank you. Um, and my last question is, uh, advocates have reported many times that privately operated and maintained elevators are generally the most poorly managed uh, and lowest performing in the system. Uh, how will the MTA ensure that any privately built elevators through these mechanisms will be maintained? I can take that. Uh, so first, I'd like to add, mention that um, we expect that from zoning for accessibility, the majority of these elevators will be maintained by the MTA. Um, the elevators built by the MTA within the easements, as well as elevators built by developers outside of their property through the bonus, such as inside the stations or on the sidewalks, will be maintained by the MTA. The, the small number of elevators built by a developer through the bonus and located inside of their building footprint will be maintained by the developer. And it's for these elevators uh, that we have at the MTA <clears throat> very specific maintenance requirements that the developers must meet as well as performance standards. Um, and this is all laid out in our developer agreement um, before they even start construction. And a few of these requirements include uh, an elevator availability rate that meets or exceeds 96.5%, um, a requirement that the developer respond within two hours of not being notified that there is an elevator outage. Uh, there is a requirement to include MTA as a third party beneficiary on the elevator service contracts so that the MTA has the ability 
to request a repair if 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 there's an instance where the developer is just not responding within two hours. Um, there's also financial security that the um, owner must meet um, <clears throat> on their maintenance as well as their capital replacement obligations. Um, they have to provide <clears throat> bank letters of credit issued to the MTA. And finally, another example is uh, they have to install performance monitoring equipment inside their elevator to report real time service status that is the same as uh, the sa uh, same <clears throat> performance monitoring equipment that we ourselves install in our elevators. Thank you. Uh, that's it for me. Uh, there being no further questions, uh, the applicant panel is excused. Uh, and now I will uh, call up the first public panel on this item, which will include um, Mike Schweinsberg. Starting time. Hold on. Sit, sit, sit. We're going to start, so go ahead. Okay, so the printed testimony I submitted differs from what you will hear. As I excerpted the essence of my remarks to conform with the two minute time limit. So Could you bring the microphone just a little bit closer? Don't worry, Mike, I'm gonna give you some time, so. Great, thank you. Uh, so, you know, I, yeah, I cut ahead, it in ahead. half, basically, but you, you have the written testimony in full. Yep. And then late yesterday afternoon, I was sent a 100 page document updating the text amendment, and it appeared to me during a very brief glance through that some of the issues I will speak of have been addressed, though I can't be certain that what we're seeking will be accomplished satisfactorily. Those are my comments. Now, so I'm the president of the 504 Democratic Club, the nation's first and largest, advocating for the civil rights of people with disabilities. For years, we have been promoting more usage of this concept and realize there have been some missed opportunities but it would appear now we're on track to achieve far greater accessibility than we might have imagined before the introduction of ZFA. Our chief concerns lie in the possibility that these bonuses being awarded for environmental or beautification purposes, as well as walkability. We do not totally rule out these possibilities, but the consensus is that accessibility must be prioritized. So we would find improvements other than true accessibility to be acceptable only if the savings realized by the MTA go into a locked box for creating elevators or other accessibility features elsewhere in the system. We are troubled by the application of this zoning being limited to high density areas in central business districts. These areas of the city are largely the domain of the wealthy and the influential. The disability community is the, the, is the largest minority and the poorest minority, and many members of the community live in outlying low-income areas. Employment is the only sure path out of poverty, and if we are to improve employability for the disabled, we must ensure that we are doing everything we can to help us get to and from work as, e as easily as the non-disabled workforce, or we will remain poor. So the proposal should be expanded to some of the transportation deserts in the far reaches of the subway system. In summation, we strongly support ZFA and join with many others calling for improvements as outlined above. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for your testimony today, and thank you for your patience uh, being here all this time. We really appreciate it. Thank you. It's a good to see you again. Thank you, Ken. Uh, calling up our next uh, group of panelists, we have uh, Bradley Bashirs, Jose Hernandez, uh, Miriam Fisher, uh, and Donna uh, Messinger. Starting time.
Do we have Bradley? Hello, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you, Bradley. Okay, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bradley Brashears, and I'm the planning manager at the Permanent Citizens Advisory Committee to the MTA, PCAC. The PCAC and its councils have long advocated for improved system-wide accessibility through various research reports, public testimonies, and participation in access accessibility events throughout the region. We are very pleased that the MTA, New York City Department of City Planning, and the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities has embarked on the Zoning for Accessibility citywide zoning proposal that will help advance transit accessibility more quickly and take much needed pressure off the MTA's struggling capital program. As we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic drastically altered the lives of millions in our region and beyond, including pausing the MTA's capital program, which is essential to delivering more accessible options for system riders. Despite this pause, in 2020, the MTA completed 11 new subway station accessibility projects and has increased from 70 to 77 the number of stations it will make accessible in its 2020-24 capital program. While this progress is encouraging, there is still so much work that must be completed considering that just 28% of the 493 subway stations, including Staten Island Railroad, are accessible. Two-thirds of Long Island Railroad City stations are accessible, and just half of Metro North City stations are accessible. Therefore, the City Council should definitely approve the Zoning for Accessibility proposal to support increase in accessible stations within the city for tens of thousands of riders who simply need more options for full participation. Whether wheelchairs are in crutches, parents with children, passengers with luggage, or seniors simply trying to get across town. ZFA will allow the MTA to work with private developers building next to existing stations to provide more space for the MTA to build elevators and other station access improvements. This will come at no cost to taxpayers and allow the MTA to set resources aside for additional accessibility projects. We all at one time and another in our lives will need accessible, accessible travel options. Therefore, finding innovative ways such as this proposal uh, will go a long way in helping to realize a more accessible MTA network for all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony today. Uh, next, we have uh, Jose Hernandez. Starting time. Hello, and thank you. Uh, my name is Jose Hernandez. I'm a person with a disability, and I'm the New York City uh, Advocacy Coordinator for United Spinal Association. I'm also the president of United Spinal Association's New York City chapter. I support zoning for accessibility because it will increase the availability of accessible subway stations for individuals who use mobility devices. As the president of the New York City chapter of United Spinal Association, we represent many individuals who use mobility or who have mobility challenges. Zoning for accessibility will make it easier for my members to get around the city, whether it be to doctor's appointments, school, or social events. I am even more in favor of ZFA since it has been changed to require ADA access at subway stations to be considered first. Chair Moya, your connection to uh, with uh, Eastern Veterans, uh, Eastern Paralyzed Veterans Association, which is now United Spinal Association, and your work with Terry Moakley and James Weitzman, you know how hard um, they have access, uh, advocated for uh, accessible transportation. Terry practically dedicated his entire disabled life to ensure that disab uh, disability or individuals with disabilities could access public transportation. This is just an extension of that. ZFA will uh, start to make the subway system that much more accessible. And Terry would have been here right now supporting ZFA if he had not passed away seven years ago. That's why I am here to continue that advocacy and to ensure that equal access is given to those with disabilities and ZFA will help to achieve that. Thank you. Uh, Jose, let me just say that you just uh, mentioned uh, two of the greatest people I've ever met in my entire life and uh, Terry was a great man, taught me a lot. Uh, he's a, he was a true uh, fighter and advocate. Uh, he's sorely missed and you are correct, he would have been here uh, fighting it out and gutting it out to make sure that uh, everything was done to really accomplish this. And uh, of course, uh, uh, Jim, just such a great guy. Uh, but thank you again for uh, all that you do, uh, your testimony today, uh, and your continued fight to, to see this uh, come through. Uh, it really is inspiring. So thank you very much uh, for being here today. I'm here today because Terry got me started here and you know, 
He's Thank a great you man, for everything and Jose. He was a great man. Absolutely. Thank you Thank again. You. Have a All good right. one. It's it. Next, uh, we have uh, Miriam Fisher. Starting time. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. I'm Miriam Fisher. I'm speaking independently as a disability advocate, as somebody who um, became disabled, being hit by a taxi and in a coma and in and out of hospitals for most of my adult life. Despite the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990, 31 years ago, the, the subway is still not accessible for everyone. Approximately one half a million people in New York City have ambulatory disabilities and about one million with disabilities have disabilities with varying needs. We see few people in the subway in wheelchairs because of the tremendous difficulty navigating the system, going from accessible point A to an inaccessible point B destination, such as a job, is almost impossible. An alternate circuitous route must be carved out, often adding hours to the commute and complicated planning. Most of us don't have to face this, but use the most sufficient, quickest route if our train is stuck, we are mobile and can find alternatives rather get strand than getting stranded for hours. This is discriminatory, not equal access to transportation. Separate is not equal. Approximately 900 elevators still need to be constructed to make the system 100% accessible. Only about 25% to 30% of elevators, depending on how many are counted, out of the 472 or 500, including Staten Island stations, um, are accessible. An important avenue to pursue this is the Zoning for Accessibility Project, which uses partly developers' funds for elevated construction and frees the MTA to use the savings for more elevators. Elevators are for everyone, for people with disabilities, seniors, parents with strollers, bad backs, knees, pregnant, mothers-to-be, travelers with luggage, just de delivery person. The young 22-year-old mother, Malaysia Goodson, who fell and died on the steep steps at the stairs at 7th Avenue IND Station, holding her baby daughter in her stroller, reminds us how vital the need is for elevators. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you for your testimony today. Uh, we now are going to call up uh, Donna Messinger. Starting time. Hi, my name is, can you hear me? My yep, name is we Donna can hear you. Messinger. I'm a wheelchair user that lives on the Upper East Side Community Board 8. I can't stress how important it is for you to implement zoning for accessibility. As a wheelchair user, I'd like you to think to um, think about how difficult it is for me to just, just spontaneously take a subway. So much thought goes into it. Which subway do I take? Is it accessible? Is there an elevator on the other side? It's actually quite exhausting. I just want to get in the subway like everybody else. Equal access for all. New York City is the greatest city, but we need to be more accessible excuse me, more accessible. This is not just for me, it's for all the other people in wheelchairs. Strollers, crutches, and an aging population. Follow me around, see what it's like. Don't wait until it affects you in some form, because at some point it will affect you, or a friend, or a relative. Zoning for accessibility is the start to make this city more accessible. Please vote in favor for it. Accessibility benefits everyone. Don't discriminate those of us that just want to do the same things equally as everybody else. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Thank you to the panel. Uh, we really appreciate you uh, being patient. Uh, and thank you again. I'm going to call up the next panel now. Uh, Craig Wallenstein, Hassan Mamun. Felicia Park Rogers.
Okay, we're gonna, uh, do we have uh, Craig? Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you, Craig. Oh, okay, I'm so sorry about that. I'm no, sorry. it's okay. Okay, um, so anyway, hi, um, my name is Craig Wallenstein. Um, I'm a travel trainer as well as a disability advocate. Um, travel training, I work with people with disabilities, the elderly, disabled, and I train them how to use buses and trains to travel and navigate around the NYC travel system, MTA. So um, accessibility is really important um, for the greater independence for parents with strollers, for the elderly, and obviously people with disabilities, wheelchairs, walkers, and so forth. Um, but um, we will have immediate access to trains without the need of a bus first to get to a train, which frustrates me a lot. Um, this will save time and motivate more people to travel safely again and live their lives more efficiently. More independent travel via accessible trains will bring more job opportunities to us as well. Um, right now, I know the elevator on 9th Street and uh, 7th Avenue in Brooklyn. Um, hopefully, we'll be gaining an elevator soon there. And it'll be great for me because every time I go out to use a train, I always have to use a bus first. So I'm very much looking forward to that. And um, this is just a great opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Thank you again for your testimony today. Uh, we're now going to uh, go with Felicia. Starting time. Hi, my name is Felicia Park Rogers. I'm the Director of Regional Infrastructure Projects for Tri-State Transportation Campaign, a transportation policy and advocacy organization working on transit and transportation matters in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. I'm here to state Tri-State's strong support for the Zoning for Accessibility Program. The Zoning for Accessibility Plan is exactly the kind of innovative policy solution that will speed up the MTA's progress in building a modern, accessible, world-class transit system. Prioritizing transit improvement projects, particularly those with an equity focus, is crucial for ensuring that New York City's pandemic recovery is both fair and environmentally sustainable with less dependence on cars. We commend um, all of the parties involved who worked on the Zoning for Accessibility for committing to expand transit accessibility on a faster timeline and for less money. Less than 30% of our subway system is currently accessible. This is simply unacceptable. As new developments are considered, this plan will increase opportunities to make desperately needed investments in subway accessibility and improvements. We are glad that MTA is dedicating $5 billion in its 2024 capital plan to increase the number of elevators across the system. But the fact is that that is not enough. We need more. This plan will incentivize private developers to participate in transforming our system into one that can be accessed fairly by all. The changes in the easement certification, certification process and the transit improvement bonus expansions will allow oversight while also streamlining those processes and increasing access to transit. We encourage you to pass the ZFA. Thank you. Thank you, Felicia, for your testimony. Uh, we're gonna try again uh, if Hassan uh, Mamun is still on, Hassan? Here we go. Hassan, if, uh, can you hear me? Hassan? Hassan, if uh, you can unmute yourself.
Hassan, if, if you can unmute yourself, uh, if you can accept the unmute request that is being sent to you, we can begin. Can, can you, can you hear there me? you go. Yeah, sorry. Uh, no, I it's stay, okay. Can I stay as um, an attendee only? Sorry. It's okay. Whenever you're ready to begin. Yeah, that's all. Thank you. Hassan, I think you might have muted yourself again. I think he indicated he only wanted to stay as an attendee. It, Sergeant, could you, uh, Martinez, could you repeat that? Uh, Mr. Hassan indicated that he wanted to remain an attendee. Oh, okay. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Hassan, if you want to submit testimony, uh, please feel free to, to do so. Uh, we thank you again uh, for your patience. Uh, there being uh, no further questions for this panel, the panel is now excused. Uh, and if there are any remaining members of the public who wish to testify on the zoning for accessibility proposal, uh, please press the raise hand button now. Or for those in the chamber, please see the sergeants now to prepare a speaker card. And the meeting will briefly stand at ease. Okay, there being no uh, other members of the public who wish to testify on LU number 838 and the citywide zoning for accessibility proposal, the public hearing is now closed and the item is laid over. Uh, that concludes today's business. And as a reminder, uh, the public, uh, as a reminder, public testimony for any item heard uh, today may be submitted in writing via email to land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. And I would like to thank my colleagues, the subcommittee council, uh, the land use and other council staff, including uh, my co-pilot here as always. Uh, thank you, Arthur, and the Sergeant at Arms for doing a tremendous job always uh, for participating in today's meeting. Uh, this meeting is hereby adjourned. Welcome, sir, anytime.